Weekend is FT Live after a little Labor Day action, which didn't have us live, but actually did have more podcasts for you. If you need to get caught up, there's a lot of interviews from the weekend. It's Braun, it's Kratz, it's Perzinski. We're going to talk to Russ Dorsey in a minute. Bill Shaken will join us in about 15 minutes. More on the Julio Urias arrest and also on Otani's latest update on his injury. Mike Tockman will join us an hour or two. And the GM of the Milwaukee Brewers. Matt Arnold, who first GM you knew from your Milwaukee days, first is this the first GM? Yeah, we've had him. Current, first current GM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the show, I like it. All right, can you get after it, Kratzy? Because you knew him from the Brewers organization days. Well, I knew him as a GM, and now he's the head of baseball operations. So maybe not. Maybe maybe he won't mm. get after it. Now he's he's straight up. Like he's he's very honest. I mean, you, we heard about it in the whole Burnsy sit down at the lunch table kind of discussion. That's how he that's how he was when I was there. He's very down to earth dude, and I think he'll give us some good insight on some some stuff we don't know about. And you're coming off some traveling, so are the Twins significantly better than the Rangers now? Uh, well, no, they played a long-ass game. It was like three hours and 15 minutes. I'm like, what the hell? That's long, long these days. Uh, you know, that used to be called – you know what that used to be called? An everyday game? Tuesday. I know. I know. It was so – it was like, oh, gosh. You're looking at your watch, and you're like, gosh, dog it. Dude, three hour 15, and I felt like when I called games, I always had the long ones. I feel like 315 would have been like a short day for me. It's crazy now. It's no, two and a half hour games now. It's a really different world. It's so I know I was so disappointed in them. But before we get, I have to say this. So before we, today is my daughter's 18th birthday. So happy birthday, Ava. I love birthday. you. Happy birthday. You're 18. You guys had a rager yesterday here. I mean, I it wasn't really a It was kind of a, I mean, for an 18 It was kind of a rager. Party, yeah. Like 60 kids running around I saw here. Whatever That's a rager. Kind of, there was a huge slide kind it's of still thing. out there. You want to go do it? Y- yeah. Yes. After the show, I'm definitely <laughs> yes. down. Yeah, no, they still, they still like the bouncy housey. I'm Water all about it. Thing. That's not like the kitty one. The one, no. And you, I think you posted on Instagram. Like it's legit. No, it's it's got height it's to like it. It's like twenty five feet high. Yeah. Yeah, they like that. And then we got a guy to come over and take them on on the tube. Nice. So I didn't have to do it. Yes. We hired a taco truck. And we had Dang. a truck. That was a big yeah. league birthday party. It we went had hard. A, we had an ice cream taco guy that came over and did ice cream tacos. Yeah. Choco tacos. They went hard, dude. Yeah, it was. I mean, listen, you only turn eighteen once. Until you I'm turn 36, you. and then you're twice that old. <laughs> and 18 is different from 21, but, like, that's a good party for 18. Yeah. I like it. All right, we got a lot to get to, and let's bring in our friend from Stadium, Russ Dorsey, joining us to go over some of the top news. It is Charge the Mount Tide. Time powered by Tiza. Russ Dorsey looking fresh, as always. Russ, how you doing, dude? Let's go right into Dodgers Braves from the weekend. And the series ends and started on Thursday, so I ended – technically on Sunday and the Dodgers did pull off a dub. What did you learn? What did you like pros cons takeaways from that whole series? I think for me, it is, and also good to be with you guys today. It was the game that everybody, the series that everybody wanted to see, right? I think you look at it and baseball fans, that Thursday night game was the game of the year by far to me. And you're having, you know, the two best teams in Major League Baseball going at it. But then you also have the game within the game of, you know, Ronald Acuna Jr. against Mookie Betts, right? I think Ronald heard a lot of that chatter coming in of, oh, Mookie is taking control of the MVP uh, race. And Ronald's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I'm still that guy, too. Not only he gets married, then goes out and becomes the first player to ever go 30-60. Same game. Mookie has two homers. So it was really fun. I don't think I learned anything because I – thought going into that series, those were the two best teams in baseball, but it lived up to the hype. And I think that's something that's always enjoyable when something that you think is going to be great, you know, lives up to those expectations. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. It's regular season. I mean, you get to see them match up against each other. See, my thing is, even though the Braves won three out of four, I think the Dodgers are certainly capable of 
upsetting oh. Atlanta. It's not like they beat the shit out of them. No. It wasn't like the Twins Guardians game listen, yesterday. Listen, I don't Kershaw. I don't think pitched. Did Kershaw pitch in this? Kershaw game? didn't pitch. You know who else didn't pitch? <laughs> Arias. Walker. Oh. Well, Arias. We'll get to Arias, which that's a huge loss for them. And I doubt he's coming oh, back. Yeah, you know he did pitch. How about, how he's about, just not pitching. Well, I'm saying he's not pitching too. the rest of the year, most likely. Walker Bueller pitched two perfect innings in a rehab outing. Yeah, but he's not going to be a five or six inning guy. He playoff. might be four or five, and I like four or five innings from Walker Bueller. It's probably no Kratzy, not four uh, or five. I mean, he did two. It's it just September uh, just terrible. started. I mean, they cap him at three. I would I would say just because of he's what he's mm-hmm. coming off of. And I hey, you know what? I mean, he's going to be legit out of the bullpen. Yes, but how many innings he's going to give you? I don't know. All right, so no, my, my what I meant by doesn't matter is like okay, so the Braves won three out of four. It was a great series. Like yes. The games were competitive, other than Boot Mookie versus Ronald. I mean, which was unbelievable because it was like, boom, one guy does something, and it was like every day, right? Oh, I'm gonna do this, and then you know Ronald's like, I did watch this, and then Mookie's like two homers, and then Ronald's like, I hit the hardest home run ever, right? And then Mookie's like, oh yeah, well watch this, I'm gonna do this, and it was like and that was what was the great theater. But as far as the two teams, when you get in the postseason, it doesn't matter. I did Dodgers Padres last year. Dodgers were like 15 and four against the Padres. Padres went out and whooped their ass in the playoffs, sent them home. So, I mean, it was great theater and it was awesome. But, like, when you get to the postseason, it doesn't matter. I, I, I hear what AJ's saying, but I think it, it's cool that the two best teams in baseball meet up in the month of September, where, you know, scheduling doesn't matter at all to me throughout the year. But when you get to September and you're seeing these head to head matchups where it's a little bit of an appetizer. Right. To your point, AJ, like I want to see seven of these games in October if we get that. But maybe one of these two teams gets upset by somebody that could also happen. But I think it's really cool to have just games that are entertaining in the regular season, because a lot of times you think, oh, yeah, well, ho hum, let's just get to October. But to get that game on Thursday night that I know reading on my timeline, everybody that I know was watching. You know, I had just landed in New York. It was really laid out east and I'm still locked in to that game, which you don't always find for games on the West Coast. They were really good games. Is there anything concerning that you saw from the series, from either team? I think the the pitching for the Braves, I think that's something that could be a concern, right? Like Spencer Strider pitched in that game on Thursday, right? And, and so that's a guy that you always consider, that's a horse. That's a guy that you want to give the ball to in game one, and, and maybe, you know, it was just a bad start against a really good offense in, in the Dodgers, right? But at the same time, you guys mentioned the guys that didn't pitch for uh, the Dodgers uh, in that series, and maybe that might be something that benefits them down the stretch where you're going to start getting guys healthy, right? Walker Bueller is a guy that, to your point, Kratzy, like probably won't be a starter for them, but if you can be that guy in the bullpen that can be a, a get you six outs, Right and and high or medium leverage, that's a really big weapon to have down the stretch. Mm-hmm. Russ, I was in Texas this past weekend, Minnesota versus Texas. Does anybody want to win the AL West? Because they all sure. I mean, they had rough weekends. Uh, yeah. I mean, Texas won on Sunday. Adolis Garcia was zero for four and hit a walk off homer. And I mean, he acted like the weight of the world was off shoulders, and they go out and get waxed by Houston. But does anybody want to win the AL West? I mean, in the Rangers, but their bullpen, oh baby. Yeah, that's the area where I'm very concerned with the Rangers is that bullpen. They've blown 29 saves this season. That is not good at all. And they went out and they got Aroldis Chapman early, right? They jumped the market, you know, beat everybody to the punch there. But they really didn't add much at the deadline uh, in, you know, a guy, a high leverage guy, a guy that can, you know, kind of take the pressure off of that rotation, off that offense. And it's going to be the thing if they get into the postseason that could cost them, right? You guys know how important bullpens are when it comes to the postseason. And you're going to have to rely, if you're Bruce Bochy, on that bullpen that has not been good all year long. Um, offensively, they were a juggernaut first three months of the season. But, you know, Josh Young goes down. You know, Jonah Heim hasn't been the same player since he got back off the IL. And, you know, Corey Seager's been great, right? Nathaniel Lowe's doing what he does, Marcus Simeon. But it was a lineup that you were scared of. It wasn't just three guys. And now that you're, you know, 
it's the big boys trying to hold up a lot of that weight offensively. It puts more pressure on that rotation where it's like, hey, we got to put up zeros for six, seven innings because we know the offense hasn't been what it was, you know, in months past. The bullpen, you know, is, is shaky from night to night. And so I'm really concerned, you know, with the Texas Rangers over this last three weeks of the season. We need a rating. Who is it? One, two, three. Where do they finish? <sighs> I think Houston, when it's all said and done, is the team that gets it done. They have San Diego, Oakland, the Royals, Baltimore, the Royals again, Seattle, and Arizona. Of the three teams, I think that's the easiest schedule. I have Seattle number two. They have a tougher road, a little bit tougher road. They have Tampa, Cincinnati, then they have the Angels come in, then the Dodgers, Oakland, and a head-to-head -head against Texas that last weekend of the season. And then for the Rangers, you have Oakland, Toronto, right in that wild card mix. You have Cleveland, who's gotten themselves uh, in a little bit of a wild card mix, although I don't necessarily think that they're going to make the postseason. You have Boston, that's no chump. You have Seattle twice, and then the Angels again. I, I think it's going to be really difficult for the Rangers if you can't rely on that bullpen and you're not going to get consistent offense. To And this is a team that's been in a playoff position since April 8th, guys. And we're talking about them potentially, you know, finishing behind the Mariners and the Astros. It's kind of wild. And wait, one more. They might finish behind the Blue Jays and not make the playoffs at all. I mean, if I'm looking at these two right now and I have to pick, I think Toronto's making it and Texas is not. They're basically in the same spot in the standings, right? And Texas, um, like you mentioned, definitely, like there's some weak spots, but I would say there's more weak spots in Toronto's schedule coming up, including this week. I mean, if, if I'm Toronto and you've been playing well, but not amazingly well, this week you continue your series against Oakland. It was pretty tight in the first one. Kansas City, then you get to potentially put away Texas if you take, say, three out of four in that one and build yourself a little lead. I've got Toronto finishing over Texas, I think, all around, and especially on the pitching angle. They are a better ball club. There, is, there are better arms. There's more variety in their bullpen. There's more steadiness in their starting rotation. I like, and I know Evaldi's back now, but I like Toronto better than Texas. What about you? Yeah, I, I think Toronto has a little bit of the momentum on their side. I think the Rangers, there's kind of like this dark cloud over them, right? Where everybody's watching them. There's a lot of pressure building because everybody knows this was a team that was a playoff team since the beginning of the season. And now it's all the whispers and you're hearing, oh man, the Rangers missed the playoffs. And you know that, you know, your bullpen has not been strong. The offense knows that they're not the team that was scoring six and seven runs a game early in the season. So I think there is some pressure starting to mount for Texas. It's just, can you get yourself out of this rut? Uh, and then for I think for the Blue Jays, I, there I think there is more trust there because of the rotation. Because I trust you know Jordan Romano in that bullpen more than I trust the Rangers bullpen right now. They're just more things in favor of Toronto than Texas. Dude, Jordan Romano, just because you he went to. Your, your college, man. Don't be all like, oh, Jordan Romano's the savior now all of a sudden. That's okay. I, I, again, I did the Texas I didn't game say Saturday. the savior guy. I said. <laughs> well, he kind of is. The, he picks up saves. Yeah. He is kind of the savior. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but I, I, listen, I saw Texas on Saturday. I had them two Saturdays in a row. And, and dude, th there's just a lack of, like, energy in that. I mean, even we were there at home. They were playing the Twins, a first-place team. They're fighting for their lives. And it was just like, blah. I mean, they're, you know, listen, when you don't hit and you, you, you it's hard to have energy, but, you know, they, in their bullpen, they just, it's like they're waiting for the bullpen. It's become such a story for the Rangers. And, and Kratz, I think, would agree when your bullpen blows leads that you get, I mean, they were up four nothing in, in the game and, and psh, gone, right? I, I mean, it's like, man, what do they just, it's so hard as a team to just continually have to come from behind, even when you get leads and then you blow it and you come back. It just wears you down. And to me, when you look at the Rangers, they just look like a beaten team right now, and they got to find it quick. And that's why they brought Bruce Bochy in. But there's no help to be found anywhere because there's no way to get anybody anymore. Yeah, and I think to your point, it looks like two different teams, right? The Rangers that we're watching right now, the Rangers that you, you know, did those games two weeks in a row, it doesn't look like the Texas Rangers team that we believe was the best team in the American League and one of the best teams in baseball. And the reality is, we're in, in, in the first week of September, right? There's not a lot of time left. And so you're going to have to find some way to dig yourself, you know, out of the rut that they've been in. 
because you're going to look up and you're going to be out of this thing if you continue to play this way. And you didn't bring Bruce Bochy in to miss the post to miss the playoffs. You didn't, you know, go sign Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager to these huge contracts to miss the playoffs. And you didn't bring over Max Scherzer at the deadline to miss the postseason. So they got to do something. They got to figure something out because the way they're playing right now, it just doesn't look like they're the same team. All right, let's finish with the prospect debut. There were multiple, like Mauricio smashing the ball right off the jump for the Mets and Wells at the catcher position for the Yanks. But the the ticket is the Martian, Jason Dominguez. First ever swing in the big leagues for him. He smashes a homer off Justin Verlander, the Hall of Famer. So your thoughts on what he could do to the Yanks. Really, it's about next year at this point. He's 20 years old. They want to see what they've got. I think they've got a dude that they're probably going to bring up from the jump next year to help them out. What about you? Yeah, I, I look at it as in a really tough season for the Yankees, the month of September should be about getting Jason Dominguez, you know, comfortable in the big league, seeing big league pitching, and then just kind of imagining what the future looks like with an outfield of, you know, Jason Dominguez in center and Aaron Judge in right. And like that's big time power. And I think something that we've heard for years and years and years of, oh, the best athletes play football, best, best athletes play basketball, that dude is a monster, right? They've been calling him the Martian since he was 16 years old. And to, to see what he was able to do in his first weekend in the big leagues against a guy in Justin Verlander who is going to be a future Hall of Famer, 20 years older than him, and he takes him deep in his first game, I think it was really cool to see. And you know, the Yankees gave him a huge deal when he signed internationally at 17, $5 million. So this is a, a kid that was basically an untouchable, right? And all those talks of, oh, could Juan Soto go to the Yankees? Well, you didn't want to move Anthony Volpe, and you didn't want to move this kid, Jason Dominguez. So I think they, there, is, there, is, there is some pressure on him to live up to the hype, live up to the expectations. But if he's going to play the way he's played in his first week in the big leagues, I think he'll be okay. Russ, here's the thing. You're in Chicago. This is what teams that aren't going to make the playoffs do. They call up guys that are supposed to make an impact. There's a team in Chicago. They ain't winning shit. And they called up nobody. Like, where's the Jason Dominguez? Who do you the want them to call up? They I don't, don't have him. That's what I'm saying, though. <laughs> like, where's the Austin Wells? Where's freaking Mauricio? Like, I want to – They don't like, have him, dude. To your point, to your point, AJ, like we talked about last week, this is like they haven't developed that guy. Right, like you said, I think they, I, didn't, I, didn't I think Colson, I think Colson Montgomery is the next guy like that. Like he's a top hundred prospect, but other than that, he's not ready to come up. Like he's not ready, like a Jason Dominguez to come up or Ronnie Mauricio, uh, etc. And so, if you don't have that guy, you're not going to just promote guys just to promote guys. Like they should be ready, right? You should okay. believe in them. Yeah, and good news for White Sox fans. We have a That's What He Said segment later where we'll hear from uh, Jerry Reinsdorf and Chris Getz. So Why? don't you worry. We Why? won't go a show without them. Why Russ, do we have to talk about it? Russ is like, all right, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you, dude. We'll see you later this week. Bye, guys. <laughs> Cheers, man. Uh, use discount code FOUL for 20% off your first order at TizaEnergy.com. Don't dip with tobacco. Don't. Use nicotine. Use Tiza. Okay? That's my own slogan. And our first poll question of the show, scan the QR code on the screen or go to your browser and type in watchstadium.com slash foul territory. What does September strength of schedule mean to you? A, nothing. B, can make or break. Or C, don't sleep on the rebuilders. Like, do you look at some teams and go, eh, that's not a breeze. That's not a sweep for me. So let us know, A, B, or C. We'll go over those results later. We'll swing back with Bill Shake in all things LA. The arrest and also the surgery coming up for Shohei Otani. Um, so I do like, I started doing a lot of Jim Carrey's like, uh, you know what? That, you, or sorry, you know, you could poke somebody's eye out with that thing. Take care now. Bye-bye then. <laughs> uh, I love Jim then, Carrey, bro. <laughs> Yeah, Jim Carrey, and then I do a little like Schmeagle, like Oh my God, that's solid! Wow. I don't, I don't have counts down, but I'm gonna give it my best. But uh, I, I've been working on my Bud Black, so here it goes. Craig, listen, we talked about this earlier. We talked about it earlier. 
you got a good ball club. We got a good ball club over here too. We got guys with change ups. We got guys with sliders executing down, <laughs> executing the ball down. We got good. We got good bangers. We got good pop in the lineup. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's one of those. But it's one of those things. Like, you know, we're we're good too. We're good too. I I have no I have no counsel impression. Sorry, but this this is hip. Like he kind of goes like this. Like we're, we're good too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Listen, Craig. Listen. We're going to go out there. We're going to roll the balls out. Doug's going to roll the balls out for us. But good, good crew here. Good crew we got going on. And we're going to we're going to try to beat you guys. We're going to try to beat you in Milwaukee. If we can get one in Milwaukee, we'll move to Colorado and try to get two. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. That's awesome. Man. Wow. And now back to foul territory. Back at it on Stadium, it's FT Live. Bron Pierzynski, Kratz, and our friend Bill Shakin joining us right now from the LA Times. Too bad there's nothing going on in baseball in the Los Angeles area right now. <laughs> Bill, great to see you. Unfortunately, we got to start with some really shitty news and mostly just thinking about the victim right now, but we do have to mix in because it's a baseball show. Some of the baseball components of this and waited to talk to you about this. Julio Rios arrested on Sunday night on suspicion of a felony charge of corporal injury on a spouse. That was according to the Sheriff's Department in LA. He was released on bond. He's got a court date for later this month. He's not traveling with the team, of course, and this is the second time there's been an issue on this front that we know of. And there's your tweet from Bill Pat Plasky, who you work with, is saying Harias simply cannot be allowed to pitch again for the Dodgers, a column that he wrote. So take us through the current situation and also looking back for our fans. In 2019, he was suspended 20 games under that domestic violence policy. He wasn't arrested, but um, the league can still impose punishment. So your thoughts and what's next here? Yeah, I think the point you just made is the most important one, that under baseball's domestic violence policy, you can be disciplined whether or not you are charged with a crime, whether or not you are convicted of a crime. So baseball decided yesterday after word of the arrest surfaced to launch its own investigation. Meanwhile, uh, the police in Los Angeles will turn over their findings to the district attorney here. That's a parallel investigation. One of them could result in a charge for a crime. One of them could result in a suspension but they don't necessarily run together. The timetable does not necessarily run together. So it probably comes next because this is what usually comes next in these situations is that Julio will be put on what baseball calls administrative leave. It's basically step away from the team, give us a few days or weeks to investigate. You'll still be paid, but you won't be playing and they'll go from there. Because of the fact that he was arrested, does that have any more of a weighted like result for this? Or is it really because last time he wasn't actually arrested and charged and he got 20 games? And also, does that go on top of the fact that he's already violated this, this policy from MLB earlier in his career? Yeah, I mean, Julio has not been charged at this point, so I just want to be super clear on that. But Based on, as you noted, he's been suspended 20 games under this policy for a previous incident in which he was also not charged. So he would be a second offender under the policy. He would be the first player to be a second offender under the policy. And so because he was suspended 20 games last time, there's no mandate in the policy for how long a suspension would be. But you would have to think logically that a suspension for a second offense likely would be longer than a suspension for a first. Bill, is there any uh, precedent set? Or, sorry, uh, by the Dodgers because of the whole Trevor Bauer thing? Because he was never. I mean, it seems like we don't know all the details clearly, but like they were, they couldn't wait to be like, see you later. So it seems like they've already set the precedent for this. Now, I know it was a little different situation, but, man, the Dodgers are like, we ain't messing around. Like, Trevor Bauer, you did this. See you later. And this is, this is Julio's second alleged offense. 
Yeah. And in Trevor's case, as you mentioned, like he was not charged either with a crime, but baseball did its own investigation. And because Rob Manfred does not need to convince members of a jury to put a player, you know, behind bars, it's a much lower standard. You know, do we think it's more likely than not that he did these things? Yes. Did baseball talk to more than one woman who claimed Trevor Bauer did these things to her? Yes. Did Trevor Bauer get the longest suspension ever given under this policy, even after an arbitrator reduced it? Yes. So that's all the stuff that went to the Dodgers thinking. The other thing, quite frankly, is that the Dodgers had a big decision to make because Trevor Bauer was still under contract to them for this entire year. So they had to say, do we want to pay Trevor Bauer to pitch for us this year, or do we want to pay Trevor Bauer to go away? And obviously they chose the latter. But Arias' contract is up at the end of this year, and it's entirely possible the Dodgers may not have a decision to make because either an investigation might still be going or a suspension might be handed down. And either way, that would carry us through the end of the season. It sounds like there's at least something to this story, whatever happens in court. Obviously, that's past our expertise. But my two questions are, first, from a team perspective, to add to what AJ is talking about. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like he's coming back to the Dodgers He's got that court case scheduled for the end of September. Of course, the Dodgers are going to be a playoff team. But even if for some reason, like we get to the end of September and it, it's going to take some time or, you know, they're not able to, to keep him off the field for a certain chunk of time as, as a league, like do the Dodgers want him pitching for them after what's gone on in the past? And it seems like already a lot of public pressure from fans saying like, we don't want him on the field with situations like this occurring multiple times. So let, let's cover that first, like chance that he pitches for the Dodgers or for anyone the rest of this season seems like almost zero. No, I think it's unlikely if for no other reason than the calendar. I mean, these investigations don't happen in 24 hours. So I would imagine major league baseball wants to wait to see what the police and the district attorney turn up, see what evidence they can get from them to the extent that the authorities are willing to share it. They do their own investigation this just takes time. And like I said, you know, whether he's suspended or he's not, that process takes some time. So I don't think he'll be playing again this season. And then as we discussed, that's not going to be an issue just for the Dodgers. It's going to be an issue for 30 teams because he'll be a free agent. Yeah. That's the other component is, you know, how much do you think this impacts him? Cause at one point in the off season, again, I want to like reemphasize that this, this is pebbles compared to, what the big picture and what the criminal um, potential criminal case looks like, but this is a baseball show. This was a player that probably would have been a 100 plus million dollar pitcher this off season based on past success, even though this year has been up and down and also his age, he's a young free agent. Now I would think it's hard to imagine that he's a, whatever it is, nine figure salary guy, and that there'll probably be some teams, depending on how things shake out, even even if there's not a ton to this, right? Even if it doesn't end up in, say, um, getting convicted in anything or it's a shorter suspension. I think there's some teams, Bill, that are going to say, nope, off our list, enough for us. I mean, the Nationals are a ball club, but some people pointed out publicly that immediately cut Starlin Castro before even he was investigated or anything else. And I know he's a vet and a different kind of value to a team. But point is, I think some teams are just going to say, nope, not dealing with this. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to last winter, as we talked about, the Dodgers were on the hook for Trevor Bauer's $22 million, whether they kept him or not. Once they said, we're not going to keep him on our roster, there were 29 other teams that could have picked him up, and the Dodgers would have still had to pay all but the minimum. So for $700,000, 29 other teams said no to Trevor Bauer. Julio Arias would be, as we talked about, if he is suspended, the first two-time uh, offender, if you will, under baseball's policy. Americans like to say, give people a second chance. So the question is, did Julio already have a second chance? Yeah. Dude, well, well, before we – I want to know, like, what, what, I know we're just going to be speculation here. Yeah. But if he was already banged 20 games, and then we saw what happened with Trevor Bauer, I mean, what are we – are we looking at 100 games here? It depends. I mean, there's a I lot mean, of I don't factors. know. Again, yeah. we don't know the details, but I'm just thinking like he already got 20, right, for something. And now this is the second time. Like, we could be talking 
Trevor yeah. Bauer got like what a year, hundred and something games. I'll get you the exact number in a and minute. Then they reduced it's, it down to like one hundred and twenty or something. It was crazy in the two hundreds. They got it, it was down like to the crazy 100s. numbers. Yeah. yeah, and maybe Bill's got better memory than I do. Otherwise, I can look it up in like thirty seconds. But yeah, I, yeah, mean, I would agree, was, Bill. If, if we're guessing, this is going to be a massive suspension for Julio again, is my guess. But what do you got? Uh, Bauer was three twenty four, and it was reduced to one hundred ninety four. So Holy a lot geez. either way. So that's two years. He was suspended yeah. for two years, basically. 324 yes. is two years. Yeah, right? yeah. And then he reduced it to about 194 a year which and a quarter a year or whatever. Month. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. So, no, it's big. Yeah. I mean, Julio Arias, I mean. This is awful. It's just awful. On on many fronts. Oh, oh yeah. But, again, most importantly, like, th- this this cannot happen as, as an no. individual. It's yeah, well, a, a criminal matter, obviously. Again, goes without saying. So, um, all right, let's get to the other side of town. Shohei Otani and the mystery of his arm, at least getting some answers from Nez Bolelo. So why don't you take us through it? And that's his agent. What you thought of the comments from his representation in terms of what to expect from Shohei going forward, like his free agency and next year, what's he going to do? It sounds like we're going to get some answers soon. Uh, maybe soon. We didn't get many answers last night. Um, but what Nez wanted to convey, I think, most of all, other than to thank people for sending well wishes, was that Shoei fully plans to compete as a two-way player going forward, and he plans to be in somebody's lineup on opening day next year. So whatever you've heard about, maybe Shoei should take some time off and maybe not hit, and he can get back as a two-way player faster next year, that's not going to happen. Is Shoei determined to play next year from opening day? That's what they want to do, at least as a hitter, no matter what happens with the elbow. But that would be a pretty aggressive timetable because when Shohei had Tommy John surgery last time with the Angels, he had the surgery um, at the start of October and he was not ready for opening day as a hitter. So we will see. There's still a month left to go in September. And frankly, the issue could resolve itself because while Nez Bolella was talking last night underneath the stadium in a suite, Shohei was out on the field taking batting practice, hurt his oblique, was scratched from the lineup. He's getting tests today. And, you know, as you guys know, obliques can be fairly prickly injuries. They often take about a month to heal. If this is on the prickly side, uh, like I said, the issue might just resolve itself right there. So, because the agent came out and actually said something, we feel like we have information, but just because he never said anything and now he said some words, I still feel like we're in the dark listening to his interview. Was there any like back and forth as far as it seemed like he was like hinting on, well, there'd be some type of procedure, but it's not as bad. Was he, was he giving us information or was he kind of just being as vague as he could possibly be? Um, The specific point that I thought was newsworthy was he said the uh, repair from last time, the first time Tommy John surgery, that's held up fine. That's intact. The, I don't want to say less severe, but we're not starting from scratch. So the impression Nez wanted to convey was the ligament is intact and the tear is lower down. It doesn't seem to be as serious an issue. He called it as you pointed out right there on the screen, thank you, a best case scenario. Uh, Having said that, uh, he just talked about some kind of procedure. He didn't say what kind of surgery. He didn't even specify or confirm surgery at all. That seems a likely result, but uh, at least according to Nez, they're still talking to various doctors and trying to consider their options. And you know, I think on the outside, people think, look, if your priority really is opening day next year, then the sooner the better to get done whatever it is that you need to get done. But any team signing him, assuming they're interested in a long term contract, which probably they are, uh, maybe it's not worrying about opening day next year so much as having him ready as much as possible for five, six, seven, eight years. Bill, this seems like total hype train to me by his agent. This seems like he is prepping for a huge contract and he doesn't want anybody until the last minute to see the medicals and actually do their homework. He is just prepping the hype train and getting it ready for this off season. Oh, he's going to be ready for opening day. And he doesn't have the, but if you talk to other people, 
not his agent. They're like, just because it's not in the same spot doesn't mean he doesn't need Tommy John again. So this is just to me is Nez saying, hype train, give me all the money, and we'll figure it out from there. He's still going to pitch. I don't know. It just seems like a an agent doing PR spin like no other. Well, and you're 100% right. All we have to do is look back at what happened to Carlos Correa last winter. You can ask for whatever you want, but if a team finds a problem with the medicals, then that's not going to resolve itself the way you hope. Um, so we'll have to see what is actually done in terms of a corrective procedure. And then, as you mentioned, at that point, the results will be available to all the teams that are interested. And look, you never can rule out the possibility. I don't think this will happen. There's a possibility you take a short-term contract, do your rehab, and then come back so everybody can play two ways and make more money. I don't know that that is his best option. I don't know that he's going to be ever more marketable as he is now, because even if he doesn't pitch again, which he he will at some point, um, you know, he's still a pretty darn good hitter. We have all we have this video of Shohei hurting himself on well, what we think he hurt himself on that swing. Has Shohei been like kind of because I know when he went into New York, he was taking BP on the field. Has he kind of been testing other waters? Because normally he was never out on the field. Is this a new thing that he's actually out on the field hitting, or is he like trying to like pander himself to different teams and look like, oh, I am more of an amicable player than just I recluse myself and I don't t- talk to the media ever. Uh, no, the only places that we're aware of that he's taken batting practice on the field this year outside Anaheim was Dodger Stadium and Yankee Stadium. Uh, but yesterday he decided to take batting practice on the field in Anaheim because you'd have to ask him and we can't. But at the time, nobody was watching because all the media was in talking to his agent. And somebody not all the media, I guess, because somebody got the video, as you mentioned, of him yanking and pulling the oblique and then leaving the field. Mm. Interesting. Crazy. Crazy. Man, crazy. Do, do you really I think he's... I don't understand how a guy can go through his whole... Basically, his whole career and never talk to the media, ever. I know he doesn't... He doesn't have, even want to hit at BP for the media, Bill just saying, said. He's like, crazy. oh, they're gone? Do you, Bill, do you really think, like, in his mind, he's like, all right, this is my chance. Media's not out here. Like, I, I don't get the impression that he doesn't like the media or he's mean to the media, more just like mm-hmm. doesn't want to speak to them and is not really into it. You know what I'm saying? Like we're about to get to Anthony Rendon. That is a very different case. <laughs> yeah, no, he seems fine. And at the all-star game up in Seattle, he was charming, had a press conference, answered everybody's questions. Um, it's clearly not his first priority hitting and pitching are. And, you know, I understand that some guys like to talk more than others. Um, But that's one of the things the Angels, I believe, down deep think might work in their favor in re-signing him, is that they have established a routine that has obviously been very productive for Shohei, and that routine has been, you only have to talk to the media after you pitch. Well, respectfully, they're fucking crazy if they think that he's coming back, and just because they can protect (laughs) him more... Any other team is going to go, oh, you won't, you don't want to speak to the media much? No problem. There's plenty of other teams yeah. that can have a PR system built up for that and actually have a plan for winning over the next three to four years. That's the problem there. So on that front, one thing that's holding the, the Angels back significantly because Artie Moreno essentially treats that luxury tax number like a salary cap, and it seems like with the Max Stassi move, they've actually gotten under that number, which will get them a better pick when Shohei leaves. Anthony Rendon hogs up a lot of salary and his latest quote, and we know he doesn't love the game. He doesn't, he hates the media. Um, and when he was asked this weekend for an injury update, he said, quote, no Abla in Glace today. Um, then put on a hoodie and left the clubhouse. This from Sam Blum does a great job covering the angels for the athletic. Your thoughts on this situation on many fronts, not just how Anthony deals with the media, because we know he, do, he doesn't like doing interviews. It's just not his thing on any front, and he's not going to speak to them much, even if he was healthy and playing well. But should he be playing right now? Like, we don't even really have a lot of a clear picture on the injury besides sounding like it was a bruise from months back. I'm not going to comment specifically because we don't get any information on him, but AJ's our injury specialist. He's gotten a lot of bruises before. I don't know. It, it, to me, it seems like it's a great way to just not play ball, and he's not going to defend himself because he doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I was standing close by to when Anthony said what he did yesterday, and 
You know, he wasn't screaming out obscenities. He wasn't getting anybody's face. He was kind of smiling as he said it. But as you pointed out, the fans really don't know what's going on because he hasn't chosen to give anybody much of an update about what's going on. And certainly you could argue at this point in the season with where the Angels are, is there really any need for him to come back? Wouldn't you rather have him come back strong for next season? But I was looking up last night. The problem for the Angels has been not that Artie Marino won't spend the money, but that two of the three highest paid guys on the team, Mike Trout and Anthony Rendon, have played 100 games together combined over the past three years. Bill, I mean, have you seen – let's just not talk about this one This one occasion from Anthony Rendon. I mean, there's been multiple. I mean, Sam Blum has kind of chronicled these in his Twitter, yeah. which is funny. He's like, this is July 23rd. Anthony Rendon declined to speak to the media. He said he was – he did say sorry. He was walking with a limp. He expected to miss a few more weeks. Then August 6th, he was in the clubhouse today when reporters were there for the first time. He did say he's on the dead list, so he doesn't have to do interviews, so no update. Then August 8th, Anthony Rendon said yesterday in the clubhouse he'd come back to give us an update on his health. He did not return to do so. He did not today – yesterday. He did not today either. There's always tomorrow, right? Then we go to uh, – when is this? June 29th, ask Anthony Rendon how his wrist was. I have two, he said, holding him up as he walked out of the clubhouse, right? Then we go to uh, July 19th. When asked how Anthony Rendon was feeling today, he said, I'm not here, and he walked out. Like, this is a problem for me. I mean, even got Alana Rizzo, who works for MLB Network, saying, like, this is a problem and not the way – like, all we're asking for here, and I don't know Anthony Rendon from, from anybody, right? But just say something. I mean, you, just give us some update because the team's not going to do it. But, but just say, hey, guys, my shin still hurts. I'm working on it every day. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I'm back by the end of the year. And people will be like, cool. See ya. Yeah. because Cool, you, dude. We'll talk to you when we talk to you. You rep the organization, right? You are making your organization look like a fucking joke. When you don't say anything like this, it seems like you're going, ha ha, I can do whatever I want. I'm not playing right now. And they have no control of me. And they spent a ton of money on me. It's embarrassing to the Angels franchise, right? So let's not forget the altercation with the fan already this year, mm-hmm. or, which kind of went away really quickly. He's a chill dude. I've been around him for years. I, mean, I don't like, know him. So I, I'm just he's, going he's off very laid me. back. He hates doing this stuff. But at the same time, Bill, if he's not going to be on the field, he has a responsibility. He doesn't have to hold a 30 minute press conference. I mean, you tell me. If, if he did what AJ said, right, and just said, hey, guys, listen, it's been really a problem. I feel like shit. It sucks and does that every few weeks or whatever and gives people an update. I think they leave him alone. He's making this more of a story, isn't he? What I'm really curious about, and I want to ask AJ this, is when he makes these kind of comments in the clubhouse, there's plenty of other players around. They see it. They hear it. I wonder, nobody really cares about the media, unfortunately, but it's true. But Players care about each other. So in the clubhouse, AJ, I wonder, do players just laugh that off or do they go, dude, we don't want to answer for you. Can you just go ahead and answer 30 seconds of questions? Honestly, it depends on who the player is. And it depends on what kind of reputation they have. Now, I don't know because, again, you see the Angels way more than I do. But I guarantee you there's at least a couple guys in there like, dude, what is wrong with this guy? Like, just give him something. Because whoever, there's going to be somebody that, maybe it's Phil Nevin. I don't know. I love Nevin. I've known Nevin forever, right? But I think that Phil Nevin, at some point, and I don't know how well, I'm sure he has a good relationship with Rendon. He's like, hey, dude, like, I'm sick of answering these questions. Just say something. Because I can't give them the full answers without you saying something. And then other, and then there's other players who are like, ah, that's so funny. Yeah, you're, you know, you're making those guys look like assholes. But at the same time, there's other players that are like, dude, like, this is not cool. And I guarantee you there's at least one player, and I, I don't know who it is. That's like, man, we we want this guy to come back and play because he's being paid a lot of money to play baseball. And with nobody – now, the players, again, you know more, Bill, and the players in the clubhouse know more. But there's always people that question other players' toughness. And I'm not doing that with Anthony Rendon. I'm just saying there's always players that will always question other players when they don't – maybe they don't know what's going on. But if they're like, oh, he's got a bad shin, they're like, you can't play with a shin, right? Or – there's times where guys would say, like, oh, my back hurts. And other players are like, dude, you can play. Like, I've played through this before. It's just a weird dynamic because we don't – and, again, but it's only because we don't know what's going on as media members now, right? We're looking at it going, how can this dude not play? He bruised his shin two months ago. But we don't know. Like, maybe he broke – maybe there's a broken bone. We, don't, we just don't know. 
So I think that's the, it's a mystery thing. And when you don't say anything at all, it makes it worse. Yeah. And when Phil Nevin addresses it, which he's willing to do, he doesn't have much more of an update because maybe nothing's changed. He's hurt. He's still hurt. Still trying to rehab. It's still the same diagnosis. It's just going a lot slower than anybody would like. But as you mentioned, the only guy who can really shed more info on how that's going from how is it going for me is the guy with the injury, which is Rendell. Yeah, well, you think but you this know, is just more of a black eye on the Angels, though, for me. Because, okay, Shohei doesn't talk. Fine. He doesn't mm-hmm. want to talk. Now Rendon doesn't talk. Right. It, and then trial for years was notorious for not really doing a lot of media stuff. When that happens, what you do is you then put the narrative in the hands of others when you don't control it yourself. That's what pl- people don't understand sometimes, and some just don't give a shit. I, I guarantee you, I promise you, Anthony does yeah, not that's fine. care. That's his personality. He does great. not care about the Angels on that front. So, hey, Bill, this was great. Really good open discussion. Appreciate it. Great to have you on. And, of course, we'll post all this stuff on Twitter for people to be able to follow all your coverage of the drama on the Angels' side and the excitement um, and then some of, the, obviously, the drama on the Dodgers' side as well. Thank you, Bill. All right. Take care, guys. Cheers. All right. We'll swing back. We'll go over those poll results. We'll give you our picks and then a lot to get to in hour number two, of course, on FT Live on a Tuesday off the long weekend. I have a hard time believing that he's going to, I mean, $2 million. I have a hard time believing that he's going to, I mean, $2 million is a lot of money, but counts is he is Whitefish Bay. He is, he can ride his bike to the park, which he does sometimes. He is, he was able to take a game off to watch his son play in the state championship game. He is Milwaukee through and through. He was a bat boy, a player, now a manager. Like I I don't see the allure for him going anywhere else, but I also, we didn't know how this season was going to go. I know there's a chance the Cardinals were going to be good, even though their starting pitching wasn't wasn't very good, that their lineup was going to bang, and the Brewers were kind of, you know, if that's what happens if at the trade deadline the Brewers were five out, and then they get rid of Big Woo, they get rid of Burnsy, and they're not in the playoffs. Does Counts want to be there for a rebuild? I don't know, and I'm not saying it is a rebuild, and I don't know what the relationship with Mark Antanasio, the owner, is with Counts, but – to me, it's got to be a blank check. And if Dave Roberts is getting $4 million, to me, Counts needs to be right in that range. He needs, to be get, he needs to get that amount. But he's got two kids playing in the Big Ten for baseball. He wants to travel around. Knowing him, I see him pushing – towards that angle. And you, you just you have no other life. Even if people are like, oh, well, you're at home. You don't do anything else. You're not at home. You are at the park all the time, whether he rides his bike or he doesn't ride the bike. So I don't see him going anywhere else, but they should pay him. And now back to foul territory. All right, let's hit poll results. FT Live continuing. What does September strength of schedule mean to you? And most people are saying can make or break. I feel like this is a big, I don't know what you'd say, myth, Kratzy, where some people are like, oh, schedule doesn't mean that much. The shitty teams can play really well. I'm like, yes, but I always say, like, I'm I'm good playing the A's, Royals, etc. over the Braves and Dodgers, even if those teams are in a little bit of cruise control and the A's and Royals have guys trying to, you know, make the team, make the roster. I'm like, cool. They're still not as good as the Braves and Dodgers. <laughs> you're talking about playoff teams and non-playoff teams. If you're facing all like playoff contenders, that is going to be way tougher than if you're facing the Rockies, the Royals, the A's, and then you throw in a series against the Rangers who are contending. And then you go back out to Oakland like that. That and travel, I think, are two of the most 
underrated, underappreciated things. Like if a team is struggling, you that's who you want to play. You're looking to win the games. A team that's struggling is looking to see what they got, see where they're at, you know, see what can happen in these games. And that's who you want to play. Strength of schedule means everything. Yep. Yeah, but a lot of times you get lulled to sleep. You go to Oakland, you're like, oh, we're supposed to beat these teams. And they, you, they competitive and you lose that first game. And then you're like, oh, shit. We and then win. you win the next two or three. But yeah, but <laughs> dude, it happens. Like every, Because also the young guys are – you, it used to be a little bit different when you had 40-man rosters instead of the 28. Because they throw a lineup out there, and as a catcher, you're like, I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> and I don't know what to yep. throw them. And you're like, okay, wait a minute. This isn't going so well. But it is uh, – yeah, it, it, it just depends. But it should matter. But then again, you can play – the, the A's won a series against the Braves this year. I know. I mean, so – And they almost beat the Blue Jays yesterday. Yeah, I mean, but I'm just saying it still matters to me and to yes. many of you. So we'll swing back. We'll go over our picks. And then our number two includes Mike Talkman, Matt Arnold, G- GM of the Milwaukee Brewers. We're going to go over the pitch clock staying the same in the playoffs – um, a lot to get to in hour number two of FT Live. But first off, we're going to win you some dough coming up next. There was love in the air, as Matt Olson called it. They asked how Acuna went from basically no sleep to casually having a wedding and then hitting a grand slam, leading his team to a dub. He got married. His fiance. um, had to, I don't know how to explain this well with the visa. Oh, actually, let's let's throw the tweet up there so that I don't have to explain it. How all this <laughs> stuff works. But Acuna Jr. did get married. He's got some kids. And um, they just casually threw that in there while he had his biggest series of the regular season to get through. So Alden Gonzalez providing a little more context for us. He said, Acuna planned to get married in the off season. But his fiance's visa was set to expire, keeping her and the kids away for three months. He wanted them there for the stretch run. An L.A. wedding was arranged in 24 hours. And then Acuna made history. Wow. He made history twice. Uh, he yeah. got married and made history for his family. Got married and then did what he did. I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, I think uh, who said something? Uh, Matt Olson said something, too, as well. He said, I'm about to renew I'm about to get my vows renewed after all yes. the success he had yesterday. <laughs> I, I found that pretty cool, man. Look at that. Hey, listen, that's how all weddings should be, man. Shirt, jeans, just chilling with the boys. I'm sure uh, late last night they had a couple more sips of uh, whatever they had. The power of love. I don't know, Olsen said, I'm going to renew my vows tomorrow. And if he did, <laughs> guess what? I am going to take it to the house. Home run for Olsen today. Home run. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's contingent on him renewing the vows, right? Yeah, it's contagious too, man. That, that's, so I, think, <laughs> I think everybody on the team renewed their vows yesterday. Um, you know, that, that's pretty cool, man. Unique situation to do that and then come and play a game, hit a grand slam. I mean – He's going to tell his, you know, his kids when they get old, just remember when I married your mommy, I did all these great things. So it's uh, pretty cool. His and kids, his kids are. And now back to foul territory. Tuesday, FT Live, getting caught up from the long weekend and also still trying to win money on a daily basis, okay? Let's stay pretty hot and let's also do our usual thing on Tuesdays. FT Heater, every single Tuesday in the BetMGM app, we pick, and we forgot to include AJ, that's my bad. Uh, it was a delayed flight and I just did not get to it, but sorry, AJ, you were not included on the decision-making between Kratz, myself, and Once again. the Giants-Cubs game, which is the national game tonight. We're giving you uh, Cubs money line plus Kyle Hendricks four strikeouts or more. It was 150, depending on which state you're at. Um, right now at plus 185. Let's go. Nice little boost for the crowd. We've been pretty successful on this. So if you want to check that out, go for it. Let's also have a look at our BetMGM locks. Looking back from Friday, a couple L's, but Kratz, I told you, man. Miami won. It was pretty close. Perez hit that K prop in five seconds to hit my minus 115. But um, let's get you going Dude, that's again. Senga, that's a lot of bet there. 
That is a lot of bet. And it's usually good, as you can see. Missed it by a run. 40. I'm up 11.75. And now 12 picks over 500. All right, Kratzy, you got us started. Super easy today. As big as that line was, I'm going over in the Phillies, Phillies Padres game. Both bullpens got crushed last night. You got Lorenzen versus Pedro Avila. Both have given up plus six runs in their last three games, and they're both going to have to stay out there for a little while. So I'm taking the over. The over is at nine, and I think it's at uh, minus 110. So I'll put out 110 to win a hunch. There you go. And you? I am on the heater board also. I am going to go with Garrett Cole, six plus Ks, and Fiedo. Five plus Ks and Kratz in the break was like, I don't love Fayeto, but there's a lot of young Yankees up there. He's got a nasty little slider he can chuck up there. He's probably going to punch the Martian out once, probably going to get Austin Wells once. Stanton's probably good for one. Judge is probably good for one on a slider. There's four. He can sneak one in there. I just hope he's out there long enough to get it done. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Like he went up against Houston last start and went four and two thirds. How many so. punches, though? Uh, oh, that was two starts ago. Yeah, but Houston didn't strike he out. He had two. Houston didn't strike two. out. He, he did an inning outing against the White Sox, what, three days ago. One inning, one strikeout. And then four and two-thirds, two Ks. Six innings, four Ks. So, And then before that, six Ks, five Ks. So mm-hmm. it's not a lock. No, but it's fun. It's, it's locked for you. It's fun. Plus 140. Yes, we'll see. And for me, nice and simple, I'm riding the heater. More often, it's a dub, and I'm getting a little promo boost for it, so. Cubs to win, plus Hendricks getting his four strikeouts over the Giants. Giants strike out a ton, and their mm-hmm. offenses looked terrible in the second half of the season. That's what you get for not doing anything at the trade deadline. Your bonus code is FOUL, F-O-U-L, for a better offer right now as football season starting up. You download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or hit up BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your account and place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that does happen, your bonus bets will be available once your wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right. Just say a name. Home run pick. Who's it? Cody Bellinger, plus 550. Wind's blowing out 15 tonight at Wrigley. Solaire, plus 300. Foul territory, hour two, coming up. Let's hit the second hour of FT Live. We're going to talk to Brewers general manager Matt Arnold coming up soon. Dude, and I can't Mike wait. I got Topman a lot of questions for soon. him on the Brewers. Me too. Yeah, because there's a lot of there's a lot of impending free agents coming up, including their skipper. Mm, yeah, skipper, their <laughs> guy that's his boss. David Stearns has been rumored to not be there much longer. Yep, that's true. I mean, there's Burns, Woodruff. Bur- Stearns technically isn't there. He's in like a. He's in like a. I don't know what kind of role it is. Consultant kind of thing. Yeah. Light consulting. And why didn't the Mets hire him? Because they weren't allowed, right? Because they yet. couldn't yet. He's still yeah, under contract. Yet. Yeah. That, but, that's kind of a lock. That, that yeah, should have I mean, been my like lock. Yeah, that's like the lock of the century, should isn't it? Should have been my lock, yeah. But um, all right. Before we get to Mike Talkman, he's having a great year. Um, and we can ask him about this, too. 
it came out on Friday after our show that the rules will stay the same for the postseason. There are no changes of any kind. And really the news out of that is the pitch clock won't be adjusted. I know some players, including some on our show, had voiced like Max Scherzer, Whit Merrifield. Maybe we get a few extra ticks for the postseason. It's not going to happen. MLB is super thrilled with the numbers that they've seen in terms of times of time of game, getting rid of dead time, attendance being the highest it's been since 2017. And also, here's the important thing for me, and, and we can be critical, right, as much as we want on this show of the league, and we often are. On this front, at least for me, Kratzy, I'm thinking about time of game. Yes, AJ staying awake and alive and at his highest energy level-wise, doing a three-hour game instead of a four-and-a-half-hour playoff game, which it feels like especially the World Series hits that so often. So how about, you know, World Series starting at 8 and ending at, like, 10.30, 10.45 versus 11.45, where you really lose kids across the country. I say kids because they got to go to sleep at some point. So we want the young ones watching the game. and They're not going to adjust the time and make it 7 o'clock or something, but what they can do is have a tighter game with the same amount of action in it. Boost the ratings. Boost the amount of people that are watching the game. It's going to yes. be awesome. I, I think it's going to be great. As a parent, they're definitely going to be able to stay up to watch this game instead of, well, you're not, you're only, only going to be able to see the first five innings. Oh, come on, dad. You're the worst. <laughs> By the way, it's like my kids. They say, they're like, what time do you stay up till? And they'll be like single digits, which means after midnight. Yep. Or double digits. We're like, did you, were you in the double digits or single digits? My daughter's like, Single digits, Dad. What do you think? <laughs> well, let's ask Mike Talkman about this right now, who joins us on FT Live, having a great year. Mike, great to see you, man. Um, and wanted to get your thoughts on this right off the jump, and then we'll get into your season, is how the pitch clock's been for you as a hitter. Obviously, it's also a hitter's clock where you got to be ready to go. And do you think, you know, if you guys are in the playoffs, it should be extended? Or are you cool with the way that it's been working? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. you know, I think, I, 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 I think that a little bit more time would be nice. Um, you know, the playoffs certainly, you know, have kind of a different feel to them. Um, <clears throat> I think at the, at bare minimum, I think maybe a little bit more consistency, like stadium to stadium with the pitch clock. Um, I think, because mo- most guys at this point have a pretty good gauge of the amount of time they have and, and just sort of the pace of the game. And it's been, it has been really nice. You know, we played like a three hour, 20 minute game in Cincinnati on Sunday. And it was like a day game in Cincinnati in August, September, whatever. So it was brutal. And it was like, this game's really dragging. Um, and that was kind of the norm before. Uh, but I think, I think a little bit more consistency, just maybe having, somebody that's maybe a little bit more in an official capacity kind of running the clock and then maybe just a little bit more grace in certain situations from the umpire just a little more feel would be i think i think it can help or i think it only can help some of those big moments in the playoffs feel from feel from the umpire feel from like do you think they need a well i guess the umpires i think they have six in the postseason that seventh guy should he be running the clock or what are you, what are you talking about? Cause we didn't, I don't really know what kind of inconsistencies there are. All I knew was when we were in the bushes together and the dude was just like, eh, yeah, whatever. Eh, reset the clock. They don't do that now. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's, they're, they're really pushing the pace in a, uh, in triple a this year when I was down there, it was, they were, they were, it was even shorter than it is uh, in the big leagues. Um, trying to just see, you know, how much time they can cut off. But I, I, you know, I just like, like sometimes it feels like there's certain places where, you know, the ball, like there's a fly ball hit or a ground ball hit and, you know, it's not even in an out been recorded yet. And they're already starting that 30 second clock. And it's like, well, you know, I don't have to sprint up to the plate to get ready. Like, you know, or, um, you know, like, like one thing I noticed is that like in the top of the first inning, the pitcher kind of gets as much time as he wants to get ready you know, get the mound the way he wants, certain things like that. But then the bottom of the first, the guy's on the clock. And it's like, well, that doesn't really seem fair, you know, like to, to you know, the home team starting pitcher getting an advantage and getting the mound exactly how he wants, but the visiting guy doesn't. And, or, yeah, the visiting guy doesn't. So, um, you know, just like little things like that, just to sort of, like, because everybody just wants a, is even a playing, like, you don't want the clock to be a home field advantage, I think. All right, so I got to give you guys a little bit of a heads up here. Talkman, when we played together in AAA, 
Tell us who your player comp was when you were out in left field. Tebow. Tim Tebow that was, was more, more, of, a player that was more comp. of a football thing. Though. That was more of a football thing, though. Uh-oh, you got AJ's attention. The, yeah. the Gator helmet is freaking out right now yeah, I just on went, the freaking table. Yeah, wait, what? Wait, football or baseball? Because it surely wasn't baseball. Mm, uh, maybe. It, it blended at points. But <laughs> I, would like to say, I would like to say my college football player cup, Tim Tebow. Yeah, for sure. Wait, where'd you go to college? Oh, I went to Bradley. We didn't have football, but I was considered in uh, in high school the Tim Tebow. Oh, I thought you were like on the intramural circuit. Yeah. You were the Tim Tebow, the intramural. Well, intramural. in high school, he would yeah. bowl high school over truck stick everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah, just one direction. I was just going north. <laughs> <laughs> the story. The story in, is, yeah. Tim Tebow was playing for Syracuse at the time. Is that that's who right. he was with? Yeah, that's and right. He was he was not doing great. Triple A was a little bit tough for him. And Sockman was in – he was in a dark place in AAA. He had just come down from the big leagues. He was like, oh, I play for the Rockies. I made the big league team, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a big, <laughs> big-time big superstar. And yeah, Tebow like was out in left field. And so we put Sockman out in left field. And so the player comp – we have a lot of player comp issues in AAA. And his player comp lived out as, as Tim Tebow. You know uh... – I actually, I should probably thank him because, yeah, I was, I was grinding a little bit. And, uh, you know, he didn't take the most direct route to a uh, <laughs> fly ball and ended up falling for a hit. And it was the, the, my first at-bat of a double header. And I think I ended up getting like seven or eight hits that day. So I was like, Tim kind of got me hot. And I, you know, I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he should have been on Swamp Kings. Dude, talk with Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, let's get uh, let's get to this season now. Let's Wait, fast oh, no, forward. Before we get before we get, out your window, what's out your window? Oh, my window. Yeah. Uh, my my neighbor's house. Oh, can you see a flag for me? Which way the wind's blowing? Are we talking? Are we talking? Which way it's blowing at Wrigley today? Yeah. <laughs> he Is wants that, to know man. how your dingers are hitting. Yeah, I want to know if you're going ooh, deep today against the Giants and. How, how is it, though? I mean, first off, you're having a great year with the Cubbies. It's been an exciting season for them because there was a time period where like, oh, no, this team might, you know, sell the trade deadline. They said, screw it. We're going in. So how has it been? And does the word wind mean a lot more to you nowadays? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, obviously, it's like like meaningful baseball late in the season is there's there's really nothing like it. And, um, you know, I think we have a group that's really, really just um, <clears throat> such like a team oriented mentality and like a team first sort of like mentality. And, and, and it's just a bunch of guys that just love competing, playing baseball, winning, winning games. And, and, you know, I think that one of the strengths of our team is the, our ability to win games in a lot of different ways. Um, I never played at Wrigley. Like I'm, I'm born and raised just outside Chicago and I never played at Wrigley till this year. So that was sort of like, man, if there's one thing I could do still in my career, like I haven't gotten it, that'd be awesome. And I, so I was, I was unaware of just how much that win can play a factor. And it was like the first three weeks that I, that I was there, it, it blew in every game. And I'm like, you know, there were, there was a game where I, I was like, man, I'm like 60 feet behind second base here playing center field. And, <laughs> um, and then, and then, you know, sort of the weather started to turn, get some days where the wind blows out. And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, <laughs> like, just got to get this thing up in the air. But, um, you know, I, I haven't been at many other places where the wind just determines like, hey, it's either, you know, we're, we're going hard ground balls today or it's like, yeah, just, you know, do what you can to, to get this thing in the air. You wake up. You wake up now, you know, you're playing every day. You're an everyday guy. You know, you're looking at a big arbitration contract, all that life. But yeah, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you already spent your money. I know you already spent your career money, but that's not what we're talking about. You wake up in the morning and you look at the weather and to see what, which way the wind's blowing. You know, I, 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 I don't, I'm kind of out in the burbs, so so I really don't know. But believe me, when I pull in the parking lot, I look at those flags up there, and it's like, okay, what kind of day are we going to have today? And when we're walking in, it's like, if it's blowing out, I'm walking a lot faster into that clubhouse, and it's like, let's get this game going before it changes. Because it'll change, you know. It, there's, there's been some days where BP, it's playing great, 
then it comes out and you're like, what is this? Like, come on. Dude, come on. Listen, I already checked the weather day. It's blown out 15. I mean, just get one up in the air. That thing will end up 12 rows back in a basket. Maybe hit a beer snake out there. Did you grow up yeah. a Cubs or a White Sox fan? Uh, I grew up probably more of a Cubs fan. Um, okay, but I just interviews over. He said, "No, I mean, I, hey, you can't, it doesn't hey. matter. You can't have one or the other. You're no, one or the other. Why? There's no like because that's not how it, they both sucked most of the time. It doesn't matter. You still had to pick one. Nah. <laughs> I think I think that uh, I mean, kind of my perception growing up and live is like you choose to be a White Sox fan. A lot of like Cubs fan, it's like it's sort of like the default. So so I have a lot of respect for White Sox fans because it's like they chose that life and they're die and they're diehards. No, they're diehards. I swear to God, I mean it. Like my my buddies that are White Sox fans are diehard White Sox fans, and um, you know, uh, so I, I mean yeah. I rooted from in, in 05. You know, I remember. Okay, the, that's a good answer. But uh, I remember are you the sick of the song yet? and all that stuff. But the hey, song. Are you no. sick of the song yet? No. After the games. Because no. I know when we played no. the Cubs, that song would come on and we're like, this is the worst song in the world. <laughs> because you're a Cub hater. Uh, well, true, but that doesn't matter. No. But it's a long, it's a long song. Yes. I don't know and if you know, you know the story it. behind the song, right? Like, they, go, they, they wrote mean, it for I like mean, a, someone like dying of a disease and they sold it for charity and the Cubs adopted it as their song. The Go Cubs Go song when they win. That's cool. No, it's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that, but. Yeah. You never get so sick of hearing the winning song. So yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, that's why I hated yeah. it when I played there because it always meant they won. I was like, the fucking song. <laughs> hey, Mike, how different is it? Because now you've played with several organizations on the big league side too, right? So thinking back to like what Kratzy said, your Colorado days, how different is was it playing in Colorado, both from like an atmosphere, but also from like an informational standpoint, you know, where then you join the Yankees who are like, yo, we've got it all. There's a billion people working in the front office. Anything you want info wise, we've got it for you. I think the Cubs are set up in a somewhat similar fashion. So how different can it be going org to org? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really grateful of some of the things that I learned with Colorado because that was kind of still in a time where it's like you had to learn, like learning how to watch the game and like see what's happening and like pick things up sort of naturally or instinctually or whatever. Like that, the uh, like that, like I learned how to do that in Colorado because it's like, what does the starting pitcher have? I don't know. He has eight warm up pitches to figure out what he has. So, and that, and then I got to the big leagues and I got to like kind of like, I probably was annoying, but like follow around. Charlie Blackman a little bit and how he prepared and how he would watch video and the things that he would look at and, and different things like that. And he was such a smart player and such a perceptive player that it's like, Hey, I can take some of that and like learn from that. And then it's like an entirely new skill go into a team that is analytically driven because there's so much information that you have to decide the stuff that you like, or it can be really overwhelming. So, um, you know, it's like that sort of, you're just always sort of like tinkering or filtering or trying to um, like, this is what I like to have. This is what I like to know. And um, that changes as you get older too, because you just sort of become more comfortable with certain things or you realize different things about yourself or, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, I think that like, being in Colorado, you have to, you had to be so engaged. Like coming up through the minor leagues, it was like, go get them. It was pretty old school. Go get them and figure it out. And you're going to play, and you just play and play and figure it. And you know, you learn that way. So, which of those which of those skills did you implement the most when you went to Korea, and which ones made you most successful over there? Probably more of just watching the game. You know, I mean, there's there's nine other teams there's 10 teams in the league so there's nine other teams so it's like you know by august it's like oh hey who are we facing this guy we'll face him six times already so if you don't know what he has at this point like you're not you're not paying attention <laughs> um uh so so i think that just seeing like okay like this is how they seem to be this is how like we are pitching the import players this is how you know, the uh, different teams stylistically 
play and pitch and they're, this is what this guy's going to do to me because this is what he has confidence in, or this is his, you know, mindset with certain things. It's, you know, it took probably close to half a year to make some of that adjustment because, you know, it's still baseball, but just there are some, some differences in mentality that, that kind of show through in the style of play. Mike, has that helped you when you came back? Because most of the time you've been hitting leadoff for the Cubs. And David Ross, when I've talked to him, said you're one of the main reasons that kind of ignited where they were to where you guys are now in the playoff spot. So has that helped you? And how do you do that if you're hitting leadoff when you haven't seen a guy? Say you're facing a guy tonight you've never seen in Walker, and you go up there to, to hit, and you're like, well, I've never seen this guy but on video. How do you make that adjustment that quick if you say you like to watch the guy? In Wrigley, you definitely can't watch him because there ain't no bullpen to see. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, obvi- I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're, our hitting coach staff does such a great job with the advanced work. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I was referencing earlier. Uh, I had to learn about the stuff that I like, like, and, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, what, when I've been good in my career, I've, I've been on fastball timing right down the middle. And, um, you know, I think, I think adjustments are made off that, but I, I think if you're, if you're late on the fastball mechanics, break down, approach takes down, uh, breaks down, vision breaks down and you're kind of just fighting uphill. So, um, it's like, if I could just have one thing, it's like, how hard does he throw? How, like, be, be, because it's like, you know, you've seen like, whatever the number is, you've seen that number, you've faced that number, you know, and then it's like, okay, that number from this arm slot. Well, now you kind of know what that looks like because you've seen it. And that's why, you know, these guys like, <clears throat> and I mean, they're other world talents, but like it did never look like Albert Pujols or Miguel Cabrera got that fooled. They have 12,000 at-bats. So it's like, there's, there's nothing they haven't seen. So it's like, I, th- I think that that's such like an under talked about part of success for guys. It's just, it's like their catalog is so big. And I'm sure some of that was learned, you know, with your times in the minors and with uh, Mr. Kratz there, who's above you on the screen. So uh, give us something good uh, to finish up here on Kratz um, slash your, you know, your Yankee days, minors, and then, of course, the big 2019 that you had. Um, Are you surprised to see everyone where they're at now, including Kratz running America's hottest baseball show? Oh yeah, I mean, I I I tune into Kratz, the the clips all the time. I got them I got them coming up on Instagram and stuff. You know, the thing about Kratz that I always enjoyed, which was really funny, because we had um we had Brett Gardner too, and uh, he he was an older player as well when I was with him, and it was like him and Kratz would like talk about these guys in like Double A. They'd be like, "You remember this guy? You remember this guy?" And we're all like. That was like 2006, man. Like I, I don't, I don't remember anybody in the Florida State League in 2006. Like you know, they, they, that guy could, that guy could really hit. It's like, um, but that's, but that's like the cool thing is like you know you run across all these names and and all these like different things. And it was like, you know, I was in Iowa a little bit earlier this year, and and there's guys there that like they know all the players on all the teams and all the organizations and the minor league guys and where they went to college and what they hit. And it's like, I used to be like that too, you know? And it's like the cool thing. And like Pratt's can obviously speak to this and AJ, you can speak to this too. When you're around so long, there's so many names and it's like, there are little things you like you, you forget like certain guys, but then you hear it. It's like, Oh yeah. Like I remember that guy. Like that guy was, that guy was a hell of a player. That guy was, that guy had like did this or this, or I saw him do this. And it's just, it's like, the the community is big, but it's like so small at the same time, sort of. And it's just, you know, it's it's cool when when you start getting into like the later parts of your career, remembering certain things about certain guys, and you know, it's it's fun that way. And Kratz, that's where you found your true talent, which is immaculate grid, right? That yeah, but that's why I get screwed up on immaculate grid because me and Brett Gardner are talking about like Brent Abernathy and single A for Brent like, Abernathy is my roommate. Did he ever, yeah. did he ever make it? You know, it's like, oh no, he didn't make it. And you just, you just bring up random names. But speaking of random talk, you look incredibly beautiful with a beard. So I just want to make sure that when they, you know, when you reach free agency in three years that you don't sign back with the Yankees because <laughs> you are 
<laughs> you are not immaculate grid. You are immaculately handsome. Yeah, yeah don't let I, trimmed, I trimmed it today just for you. I woke up oh. and I had a bunch of dog. <laughs> I had a bunch of dog hair in it, and it was looking a little scraggy. So I trimmed. I trimmed it up just for you. That's I what I was going to say. Is the is, are the dogs doing good? Dog's good. He's thriving. He he <laughs> does what he's, he wants. He doesn't listen to anybody, and he sleeps all day. So just <laughs> living the dream. he's not mad at you for going to Korea and leaving him behind. No, because the people that watch him when we were in Korea also let him do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to. There's no rules. There's no rules at my parents' house, and there's very few rules at, at my wife's parents' house. So <laughs> they used to they used to give him they used to give him his spa day, and then put a bow, a pink bow, on his boy <laughs> dog, and he he hated it, and I loved every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they 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 dress him up and make him look all pretty, and it's like he's a man, you know. Give him give him like a tie or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, now he gets to enjoy the Chicago summer. Same with you, dude. Keep crushing it out there. Enjoy. Get that ball in the air tonight. Yeah, we'll, we'll be watching, dude. Tonight, get one AJ, up in that twenty wait. mile an hour we'll breeze. Be watching, dude. Great all to right. catch up with you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Cheers, Mike Talkman of the Chicago Cubs. It's good stuff, dude. Listen. Every crap will tell you when you were playing in Wrigley, the first thing you did was you looked at the wind because it mattered a million percent. Yeah, it's a it's a game factor, a oh, major game factor. Major game. Yeah, and it changes every freaking day. Yes. Yeah. But today I already checked when I woke up mm -hmm. and it was blowing out 15 to 20. Good day to get it up in the air, boys. That's right. He knows. We reminded him, and also, you know, if you come on this show, I think the best examples probably Trey Turner. It wasn't. Has he gotten out since he was on? I don't think so. It Seven wasn't homers. the fans deciding, hey, let's stand up for Trey and cheer. It was, hey, let's randomly go to Philly, have a 10-minute combo with him, and then he'll really go off. So, You're welcome. Anyway. By the way, the Twins are fans are trying to do that for Correa. Not going to really? happen. Really? No. No, they're trying to do it. They're yeah, trying, but they're trying to do it. the standing ovation thing for him. I mean. Uh, not original. All, yeah, not original. Carlos doesn't <laughs> need it, so. Okay, I'm just saying they're trying. No, 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 that's cute. They asked that's us to cute. talk about it on the show. He has so plantar they, fasciitis. Oh, yeah, you're right, they did. Yeah. He has plantar fasciitis. Exactly. This season's a wash. What does that have to do with hitting? A lot to do with hitting. It sucks. I had it. It consumes your life. You wake up and you play. As interesting as plantar fasciitis talk is, also Labor Day just passed, but it's still super sunny and hot in most of the country. I know, like, I was just in the Northeast now back in Florida, and it's in the 90s up there. So, And I think it's in the 90s down here. I don't even pay attention. No, it's but, beautiful. Dude. It's like 85. Dude. Right. So we've got better weather, as usual, even in the summertime in Florida. See? Spoken like a true <laughs> Orlando native. Uh, Said at Shady Rays, we've got you covered. Premium polarized sunglasses. You don't need to break the bank. Get yourself hooked up. Make sure not only do you not worry about what you're wearing because in case you break or lose or something goes down, no questions asked, they will send you a brand new pair so you can wear those shady rays and not be concerned about, you know, any problems that you have. Like if you're clumsy and you drop those sunglasses a lot, you're good. Okay. And also if you don't love the pair that you order, you can exchange for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. And exclusively for the FT fam, make sure you check out shadyrays.com and go Hit F O U L in the promo code area for not one, but two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses, getting yourself 50% off. 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. All right, let's take a look at the full slate of games this evening and specifically one that's standing out to me, but we'll get your thoughts. It is time for a little last-minute game time. Make sure you hit the game time app. If you're looking to hit a game this evening, you're like, yeah, I got a little Tuesday open. I want to take the kiddos. Um, probably for almost everyone now around the country, school just started. So if you're in the Northeast and your kids are pissed that they're back at school, take them to a baseball game tonight. Just hit the game time app for the best deals. Give us a game that fans across the country should be really looking to, especially if they're in that area, uh, make a little visit. Kratz, you can go first so that AJ doesn't steal the next 18 <laughs> games. I'm going to I'm going to watch my guy Sockman hit, hit two dingers tonight. San Fran, they need to turn it around. They are they are they they're score. not not swinging it. No. And you get to go to Wrigley, so that's that's an upgrade. So I'm flying to Chicago right after this right after the show and 
Gonna give a sockman a high five and I'm gonna head back. <laughs> you you can steal no, I'm mine going if last you got. because you know I don't want to take your pick. Okay, well I'm definitely looking at Nathan Evaldi returning for the Texas Rangers. So his last start was on the 18th of July. It is now September the 5th. Evaldi's back for a Texas team that needs him. And if you remember the first couple months of the season. He was Cy Young status. He looked like he was going to be a contender. Now, he's had injury issues throughout his career, and you're like, all right, well, at least he'll come back for them and can help them in a stretch run into the playoffs. Uh, Yeah, the stretch run emphasis, because if him and the rest of the pitching staff does not step it up, they won't be in the playoffs. Huge freaking game. They're taking on Houston. Houston was swept by the Yanks, and then they, they punished the Rangers' bullpen, especially yesterday. They need length from their starting pitching, too. The bullpen way too often has to pick up the pieces for too many innings. So Texas has to get back on the winning side of things against Houston. Otherwise, forget the division. Forget that other wild card. It's the third wild card that they need to be worried about with Toronto coming off an easy week. What's your game? Well, since you guys took the two, I would have picked. I mean, way to go. Team. Mm. And also, Framber's pitching in that game, too, by the way. They need him to start they, pitching. They've also, had a, they've also had an issue last time, Framber pitching in Texas. They cleared the benches a couple of times. They started Marcus Simeon and him might have true, some True, true, yes. But my, uh, well, the game now, because I was going to – both those games were the ones I were going to pick. So oh. Now, you know what? Atlanta's an easy one for me because I want to see Soroka pitch. He's back. And can he help them down the stretch? Can he, can he be a weapon for the Braves? But like what in the playoffs? In the he's play- not going to be in the playoff rotation, right? I don't know. That's what I'm right? saying. Can he be a bullpen guy? I mean, what's he bring to him? And then the other thing is Dylan Cease is pitching tonight in Kansas City against Brady Singer. The Royals are favored in that game. With Dylan Cease, who finished, what, second or third in the Cy Young last year? That's fucked up, though. That's offensive to Brady Singer. Brady Singer's good. I understand that, but... The, the Royals have a worse record than the The Royals A's. are worse! And they're favored. That shows you how much the White Sox have kind of, I don't want to say, used the Q word, but. What's the Q word? Quietly. You know, quietly. Something else with a Q. You, <laughs> I start and then ends in a T. I, I like to use the T word. What's that? Tanking. That too, that's another, that's a nicer High way of saying quitting. High draft would be nice, right? Scott that's Braun a, suspended. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a nicer way of Been saying. Been there, done that. Because, but that's amazing if you look at the, the the teams going into this season, if you would have said in September 5th, Dylan Cease is on the mound for the White Sox. And this is not a knock on Brady Singer, that they're they're underdogs to the Royals. Dylan's struggling. I understand, but still. Recently. I'm yeah. just saying, but going into the year, two weeks ago, you wouldn't have said that. Mm-mm. So, but Be I'm careful still going to of Bobby Plus Witt. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Dude has been scorching. Yeah, their whole Great team hit half. so many damn homers yesterday. or scored all kinds of runs yesterday. For KC, was, yeah, flying yeah. out of flying Oof. out of Kaufman. I mean, the fountains so, were filled yesterday. So that for me, <laughs> okay. Here, would you rather play this month? Okay, you're the Blue Jays. You got to sweep a series. You rather play the White Sox or the Royals? Oh, White Sox, easy, right? Easy. So yes, this is where I'll say you look at the schedule, and even though the Royals have a worse record, so I'm not just looking at strength of schedule and the percentage, that's lazy. It's a month left in the season. Just look at the fucking calendar but the and say, is- oh, here, look, KC, that's not as easy as playing the White Sox because they're, like, kind of quiet quitting, and the Royals do have a bunch of young dudes that are trying to, like, prove themselves for next year. That's the key. You don't want to play the teams that have the young dudes that are trying to make a name for themselves. You look at the White Sox and you look at some other teams that aren't having the year they're supposed to have. They have a lot of veteran-ish guys that already know, hey, I've got my contract. Hey, I'm mm-hmm. going to be here next year. Hey, this and that. <laughs> yep. So I don't know. Eh, Shitty veteran underperformers is what you're looking for on the schedule in September. <laughs> That's a, Probably. <laughs> yeah, because if, like Kansas City, like you watch them play, they have an energy to Yes, them. they do. Like they are busting it. And that's a that's a compliment to Matt Quattaro, their manager, and the players. And Salvi and those guys, I mean, they are – Bobby Witt, those dudes are like, they're going hard. Yeah, and the biggest problem also – you watch also, some teams and they're like, eh. Also, the, the thing that you will get with all of those teams towards the bottom, generally there is a theme that those teams can't pitch, right? There's not good pitching, whether it's veterans or young guys. Like, Kansas City is not going to keep up with a playoff team That Reagan's wise. guy is filthy. Is filthy. Oh. That was a great deal by J.J. Piccolo. Dude, how does he get traded for – For Chapman? Chapman was a big deal. But still, dude. How is he not pitching for the Ro- or for the Reagans? Also, I don't know. You got to read the story about Reagans, and we can bring him on. He picked up like six miles per hour on his fastball from last year to this year. As a starter, 
as a no, he was starter, he was dot ninety eight ninety nine yesterday. He sits now ninety six, which I think was what he topped before that. So I have the numbers because I just was reading about this last year. He was sitting ninety two, maxing out at ninety five. This year he sits ninety six and maxes out at one hundred one. How did he do it? Got to read the story. Oh, where it's in the athletic? Oh gosh, I got to yeah. pay for the subscription. Rosenthal? <laughs> Stop. I got you the subscription. I got. I brought you a, a present today. I brought you Jonathan Mayo's book. Yeah, anyway. How come everyone I know is writing a book? Kenny Albert wrote a book. Kratz wrote turn. a book. You got an off season to write about the the making of foul territory. No. I don't so. really think I'm a book writing kind of person. <laughs> we're no, we're going to talk to Matt Arnold in a minute. So let me run through game time for you as we're about to talk to the general manager of the Milwaukee Brewers. Also, fans, if you have any questions for him, hit us up right now in the YouTube chat. But we are looking at. How easy it is to navigate through the Game Time app. If you're looking for last minute tickets, there is no better way to get the job done. And it's very easy to get the job done in the app. If you, for some reason, are not an app person, GameTime.co is the spot for you. Killer deals on last minute tickets. The best price guarantee is always there for you, meaning you will not find a better price elsewhere. And if so, they will credit you 110% of the difference if you find tickets in the same section and the same row for less. So you don't need to plan months in advance. This is how you do it. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. And FT fam, if you want to support the show by going to a game, you use the code FT live, all caps, 20 bucks off your first purchase when you download the app and create an account terms apply. So you create your account, you go to the redeem code area, you put an FT live for 20 bucks off, download game time today, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Kratzy, you want to do the intro here? Yeah, absolutely. All right, he's ready. Matt Arnold is going to be joining us, the Milwaukee Brewers Head of Baseball Operations. Oh, what a head that is, too. Look at that thing, just monolithic. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> appreciate you joining us, Matt. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. Yeah, good to see you, too. The last time we saw each other... Before I got fired from the Brewers, I'm sure that wasn't you. I'm sure that was Sternsy. You guys had to go get you guys had to go get Yasmani Grandal. That didn't work out well for you, but anyway, we uh, <laughs> not bitter about it. But. No, 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 no. Just remember, I take I take tickets. I keep receipts. The uh, no, we had we had a nice, nice, enjoyable uh, dinner. A couple different dinners and playoffs came up short against the Dodgers, but you got to go home. Well, Cali home. And now you are the, now you're the head honcho. You're the, you're the big cheese of this Milwaukee Brewers playoff team, juggernaut. Well, also, can I piggyback off that? Because are you talking about the NLCS series, yeah. Kratzy? Okay. So here's my thing, Matt. And, and hey, great to have you on. We appreciate it. You are the first, and we'll have them all over the next few months. First current GM to join us on FT Live. A couple players per day, and it's been awesome to have many of your Brewers, and we can see why the team is thriving from a, a clubhouse chemistry perspective too, of course, a lot of great personalities. So that series against the Dodgers 2018, last time you guys won a playoff series, this team has been a consistent winner. It's not a super high payroll team. What's the secret to consistent success in Milwaukee, but also how badly are is your front office burning to keep advancing in a playoff series with that rotation and run prevention that you have set up this year? Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. I mean, look, we're I'm certainly thrilled to be a small part of this. I mean, we have a, we have a tremendous team of people here and it starts with people. Honestly, I think that's that's the name of the game when it comes to success. And, um, you know, our ownership has supported our our, our team, our, our front office, our coaching staff uh, in a great way. And so, you know, it, it started, uh, you know, all, many years ago, um, you know, even before I got here, honestly. So we, we just have a really good group, a great culture. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it, you know, and, and I think at this point, you know, like like you've talked about, we've made the playoffs here a number of years in a row. And I think we're looking to advance uh, even deeper. You know, obviously missing last year was a, a tough, a tough situation for us. And, and I think it just galvanized us a little bit more even to to want to get back there. And, and I know Kratzy was a big part of it for us uh, back in 2018. And, and he knows what it's like. And, and we have a great culture and we just want to build on that. Matt, what is it you, – you kind of cut your teeth with a bunch of different organizations, but you really made hay with Tampa. What is it about Tampa? Because there's a million guys from Tampa that are now GMs and presidents and everything, and you look at them, they're a small market team that's had success. So what the heck do they teach in Tampa, and what do you share with other people about Tampa? 
Yeah, I think it's probably similar to the stuff we have here. I mean, it's just it starts with people, you know, and it really does. And, and the good group we had there, starting with Andrew Friedman and, and Matt Silverman, and then, you know, being in the same room with guys like Heim Bloom and Eric Neander and James Click. And, uh, you know, we had Sam Fold as a player and Rocco Baldelli in our front office and just a, a ton of really, really talented people. And I was just fortunate to to be a small part of that as well. And just to learn from those guys is, is something I treasure. And, and the moments that we had and a lot of celebrations, you know, we, we had a lot of fun there and, and that's what it's about. You know, you love the game. Uh, we love to, to win and, and have fun and, and challenge each other, I think in productive ways. And we've tried to do the same thing here in Milwaukee. You guys have, and that's what I try to tell people all the time. It's that communication. It's the like human aspect of it. Take us back to either that time when you were with the Rays or all the way back to your first internship, whatever your job was with the Dodgers while you were still in school. Is this, is this the job that you wanted? Like, were you like, man, I want to be head of baseball operations? Or did you say, oh yeah, I just want to be a GM or, oh, I want to, you fill in the blank. No, honestly, not even close. I mean, honestly, I, I just, I just love the game and, and I, I just wanted to be a part of it, you know, and, and, Worked, worked my tail off, I think, like a lot of other guys and, and just wanted to learn as much as I could and, and help contribute to a winning team. And, and, you know, good things happen, I think, when when uh, when you put your nose to the grindstone and work hard and, and you care about other people, you know, and, and I think that's that's really what's what's exciting for me about this group. You know, we, we continued, I think, that momentum here, uh, you know, from from Doug Melvin to David Stearns to myself. It's, it's just having the right people around. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this and, and be a part of a great winning culture. So let's get to the trade deadline first off and chafing for the bullpen, Carlos Santana and Mark Cana, who I'm sure you've heard many times about both of them. Those are pro ABs. You're seeing that can has been better with the Brewers than he has with the Mets. Obviously Santana for years has been a guy that is so difficult to get to extend his strike zone. How have those pickups looked for you both in terms of what they're doing individually, but do you feel like from those hitters, there is a contagious component to watching those ABs for the young guys that you have. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's it starts with those guys and and the I think that the way that they lengthen out our lineup I think is something that we were hoping to accomplish at the trade deadline and and you know, those guys are experienced as well. I think adding some, you know, a handful of veteran guys here that that had experience in playoff uh environments I think is something that's incredibly important for us uh you know, to complement our young group. We do have a really young group here still. Uh, but also with a young group with experience, you know, and so I think just adding those types of guys lengthen our lineup and, and also, you know, they're, they're both good defenders as well. And that's kind of the brand that we have here. We, we play, you know, it's more pitching and defense than anything else. And those guys add, add value with their bats, but, but they're also good defenders as well. Wait, you forgot to mention, Scott forgot to mention somebody. There's a, there's a story out there that you guys had Pete Alonzo on the hook. Oh yeah. But then something happened. So can you, can you clarify this for us? Cause there's a, I think Ken Rosenthal wrote about it, something about the Brewers were close to obtaining Pete Alonso. Or, or you could say it this way. They were looking into were a lot lo of power for their lineup because oh, you can't okay. say the player. You okay, know. sorry. I mean, you can. He can. <laughs> yes. Yeah, look, as far as obviously, you know, individual conversations, we had a ton of conversations. And, and you know, I think anytime you somebody like Pete Alonso comes up, it's certainly somebody that would, would get our attention. Uh, but, you know, I, I would say we had a lot of different conversations at different levels. I, I can't speak to any specifically, but um, he's certainly a talented player, you know, and he'd fit on on just about any good team. Sp spoken like a true Eric Kratz disciple right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, right. I would have just blurbed it. I would just bleh. They would have fined me, fired me, whatever it was. I would have just set it out. Be, be, speaking of just saying how it is. What did you learn from the emotions of the players last year as you watched Josh Hader get traded away? Essentially, at this point in the season, it was a little bit earlier. What did you learn from that? And also, because we have Bernsey on here all the time, and he talked about how important it was that you had that conversation with him this year at the lunch table post game. You just popped a squat and, you know, started chatting with these guys. Like, what did you learn from the Hader thing? And how did it translate into the whole Burns conversation you had this year? Yeah, look, I, I think what the 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 challenging part about our situation is that we're going to have to make unpopular decisions here, you know, and and that's that's something we have to be comfortable with. Uh, we made an uncomfortable decision there to trade Josh Hader. Um, we thought it was the right thing to do. 
But I also, to your point, I think we learned a lot. You know, I think how we could have communicated that better with our fans, how we could have communicated that better with our, our players. Uh, we were trying to do the right thing and we're trying to win a championship here, though. And we're trying to do this, you know, and keep it sustainable. And so we do have to make those tough decisions. But at the same time, you know, that's why I want to try to connect with the players to the extent that I, I want to treat them like men. I, I want to let them know that, that we're here and that we're a resource for them. And, and so if they have questions to please come ask. Uh, I want to make sure that we're available, you know, because I'm not sure that every front office necessarily does that. Um, and having those kind of relationships, whether it's Corbin, uh, Josh, or, you know, any of our young guys, you know, I want them to feel like we can have those types of conversations uh, going forward. And I think it's a really healthy thing so that we're honest with each other about where we are uh, at any point. Well, have you sat down with any of your potential guys? I mean, I have a Corbin Burns card right here. It sits here every day. Isn't it? It's my favorite player because he makes fun of Rowdy. <laughs> every time he comes on but i mean extensions for for burns extensions for woodruff have, why have you not released rowdy yet because everyone hates him <laughs> and uh did you see his finger but i mean you know these are legitimate questions like why have you not have you explored extensions and are you going to with these guys because they're great pieces to have yeah look i mean those, you're right i mean those guys are certainly talented um you know can't get into specifics as far as you know certain contract negotiations at this point but you know i've i've seen rowdy's finger i can tell you that it was pretty gross <laughs> um you know i can confirm that that was certainly pretty disgusting um but you know as far as the the other players go we they they know and we know you know they're they're some some of the best players in in the world you know i mean we're talking about our our number one and two starters here and and you know Willie Adamas is is among the best shortstops in baseball you know and so uh, these guys mean so much to our our team and our franchise and and certainly we'd love to have them here a very long time. So I know you can't take us through say the individual conversations with player agency etc on the extension front. Can you take us behind the curtain on how those deals do get done though? For example, Freddie Peralta and that's worked out really well. Obviously, Freddie is always freaking smiling. He's been great for you guys. And how that comes about, is it a conversation that starts with ownership and you go through a player and comps and everything else? Like, what can you tell us in terms of how you get to that actual deal period? Yeah, it, it probably comes about in a, in a ton of different ways. We're just having the communication, whether it's with the player, with the agent, uh, with our ownership, trying to find common ground, I think, is the important thing on those. And, you know, obviously, we want this to be a great place to play, you know, and and. Um, you know, we've worked hard to establish that as a great place to play. And, and you know, I'll let Eric speak to it, whether it is or isn't. Uh, but we're trying hard to make sure that it is and, and that players want to play here for a long time. And so the, the, the deals come about, about uh, more organically probably than anything else. It is a great place to play. It's also a great place to manage. You have another you have another free agent who, in not just my opinion, someone else's opinion, might be one of the biggest free agents outside of Otani if something doesn't get done. How are how is the organization handling this in the sense of let's let's just give you a hypothetical. If he leaves because he wants to go and watch the boys play baseball in college, is Pat Murphy going to be your manager? Because if you if it is, <laughs> he is way he's gonna be the ugliest manager you have. In the it's like number thirty, <laughs> automatically ugliest. No, how how do you guys how do you guys handle something like this? Because I think a guy like Counts is one in. I mean, he's he's one of thirty. He's one of thirty managers that puts together a team that has a team be super successful. That everybody outside of the Brewers organization thinks eh, it's going to be a five hundred team, and every year they're back in playoff contention or in the playoffs. Yeah, Eric, I think you're exactly right. And and I'd go, I'd go a step further on, to your point. It's really not just one of 30. I, I think Craig is one of one. You know, I mean, he's he's so beloved here, I think, in our city, in our community. And, and you know, his dad worked for this franchise. He played here uh, for a very long time. He worked in the front office here. He's, you know, he's been a, a great manager here uh, and the best teammate I could ever hope for, honestly. And I, and I, I love him to death. And so to your point, it's just whether, whether he wants to be here and, and you know, ex expand on the great work that he's done or if he wants to go watch the boys play baseball and, you know, be, be around the girls as they're growing up too. Like, he's earned that right, and I, I love him to death, and so I'm going to support him first and foremost uh, ahead of the Brewers and everything else just because I care about him a ton. So, obviously, I'd love to work with him for a very long time. 
How, how do you, since you have the GM talk down perfectly, president of baseball operations talk down to like a T, how do you keep from getting attached to these guys? Because I, I would think as a human being, aside from your job, you get, you're with counts every day. You're with these guys, you know, a lot of the time. How do you keep from getting attached and letting personal attachments get in the way of what you need to do for the franchise? Yeah, I, I think you're right, AJ. I mean, we we certainly get attached. I mean, that's just reality. That's that we're humans. You know, we're not robots. And I care about all these guys. I mean, and it goes back not just you know when you when you sign a player. It's it's knowing these guys when they're internationally. You know, at, at a very very young age, or or getting being in the room when you're drafting a player. You know, and seeing them come up through our minor leagues and and how they've grown. You know, it's something that, honestly you feel proud about it. You know, it's just something you you want to see everyone succeed. And and I'm a big fan, just like everybody else. And I I pull for these guys like crazy. You know, I, I want them to have success here. So, um, you know, it, it, we I, you know I definitely uh, care about the relationships that we have with our our players, and and that I hope that you know they know that we're we're pulling for them as as hard as anybody. One more for you on counts is yeah, depending on what he wants to do for his personal life and fam life. That's one thing. Can you assure Brewers fans that if he wants to manage, it will be in Milwaukee? Yeah, I mean that—that's certainly our hope here. I mean, I—I I haven't even you know crossed the bridge about what it looks like without him because I, I love him here to death and I, I hope he's here a really long time. So, um, you know, selfishly, I, I hope that you know we can we can turn the page at some point when when it's the appropriate time. But right now, you know, we're focused on winning a championship, and he's the right leader for this team. Matt, when you go, when you we talked about attachment to players, I, I went. You have to go to arbitration with players, and it sucks. I went through arbitration, and I sat there, and the GM of the Giants at the time was across the room, across the table from me, you know, four feet away, and you're sitting there and you're looking them straight in the eye. That has got to be the hardest part, right? For for me as a player, it was like I had just gotten traded to the Giants, so I was like, eh, I don't know these guys. It doesn't. It's not as big of a deal. But if I had come up through the organization. Came up with the twins, and I had Terry Ryan. I would have Terry Ryan sitting across the table from me, who drafted me at seventeen, and made, let me get to the big leagues. And then it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you stink at this, you stink at this. And I'm like, well, I'm good at this, and I'm good at this, <laughs> right? So that has to be a, a impossible situation because then you leave the room, and you're like, okay, I love you again. And the player's like, well, you didn't love me thirty seconds ago. So how do you how do you balance that? Yeah, I, I hate it. I mean, I, I think honestly, it's te- it's a terrible process, but it is the process, you know. And so, I think both sides have to acknowledge that it's just it's just not fun, you know. And so, but it is what uh, players and owners have agreed to, you know. So we have to play within those those rules and parameters. And so, I, I hope that we can establish enough trust where that is just part of the business. That, but once that that day passes and you know the the decision is made, that we're good to go, you know. And it, and it's not that easy because to your point, like we're humans and you know, everybody, there's motion baked into that. Like you said, you, you thought you were really good and the the team didn't think you were as good at that. And some of that is show, honestly, for, you know, for that process and what that means. Uh, that's that's required, I think, by both sides, you know. And so at the end of the day, hopefully we can have a, a productive dis- discussion after, um, you know, give each other a big hug and just turn the page and keep moving forward. I, and I know it's not as easy as, as it is said. It's, it, it really is a challenging part of the part of the industry for sure. Should we change it? Because your former, your former, I'm reading what your former job title was, player acquisition, contract negotiations, and player evaluations when you were with the Rays. Should we change it? And what would that process look like if we, if we could change it to make it more, not friendly, but I mean, that's what we're talking about because you've talked about, and I think this is what the Brewers do really well and the Rays did really well, the human side of things. Yeah, I mean, look, an easy way probably, and again, I'm, I'm not smart enough to, to have the answer here, but I, I think there probably an easier way would have some kind of formula for it, you know, and just that, that the players agreed to and said, hey, we're good with whatever metrics this needs to be measured on. And then, you know, the, the, the owners decided, hey, these are these are appropriate as well. And we just come up with it. It's it's very generic. And then we just turn the page, you know, and then it's it's more wired. Than that, I think there are a lot of reasons why that that doesn't currently exist. Uh, but I, but you know, I think that would probably be the cleanest if if there was an easier way to do this. Matt, where are, are you in Pittsburgh right now? Or are you in Milwaukee? I'm in Milwaukee. 
Okay, because we always have a thing when people just have blank white walls. Mine and blink twice if you're okay, because it looks like you're in an opposite situation. <laughs> no, I'm, like, I'm not. In, I'm not in custody. I'm not in custody right now. Okay. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Whenever we have people on that have the white wall, we're like, man, it looks like they're, you know, please, please send it out. We like to make sure everyone's good. Yeah, we want to make sure everybody's healthy. AJ is yeah. for the people. <laughs> I need to get some art. Maybe I get like a Kratz jersey or something back here. I need yeah. something. Ooh. Kratz book? You get a Kratz hat, it'll take up the whole wall. A Kratz. <laughs> <laughs> a Kratz. That's what's covering the it's building he's in. <laughs> it's just right. a it's just a big fat head, maybe Kratz just a big That's the retractable roof. Um, question for you on the minor league side. This team has done a great job of building up the prospects um, and the talent that you have down in the system more upside, more depth to it, and let's lead the way. The guy that most baseball fans know outside of Milwaukee, Jackson Churio. There's a Jackson race going on right now. There's there's a few. It's a big name. It's a very buzzy name in baseball. But I like to do the comp of Jackson Holiday and Jackson Churio. They are a few months apart. So Holiday just got promoted to AAA. Will you match the Orioles suit? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, we, we've seen both Jacksons and we like them both. Um, our guy, our guy's great. I mean, I don't want to speak for the other one, but, uh, you know, Jackson Cheerio is is tremendous. And he's he's I mean, for a 19 year old kid and what he's doing in double A is is so, so impressive. And, um, you know, just just he's put himself on the radar in, in every way. And, and he's such a talented kid. He's five tools, um, you know, does everything well. And, and he's he's good in the spotlight, too. You can just tell this kid really likes it. And uh, loves the game and, and, you know, we're excited about his future. So, so you're calling him up <laughs> into the minor league season. <laughs> well, I mean, well look, my question would be, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, he's, gonna say he's not on the roster. We don't want to lose the roster. Here, no, I don't I'll, think he's going to say that. I'll I'll I don't the think blanks. they care about the roster spot to, to get Jackson Churro up if he's good to go. Right. Yeah, he's on the radar. I mean, and, and in a good way. I mean, he's put himself on the map, I think, and and he's he's a super talented guy that has all of our attention. What do you think about teams calling up their players, you know, sooner than ever? There's not exact data to this, but you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there are guys that are 19, 20 years old, and some of them come up and they thrive from the jump. Others don't. And, you know, our mostly player run show here likes to go through how some players can overcome some early adversity and sometimes teams are like, eh, I'd rather make sure that he's really in a good spot before I bring him up because I don't want him to be sent back down. How do you balance that with someone like Jackson and just anybody that you're bringing up that's got high potential that you do you like, do you worry? Oh, if he struggles for a couple of weeks, like, and we, we end up sending him down again, it could crush him. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, we certainly don't have a formula for that, you know, and, and there's it's it goes probably player to player. I mean, the one thing I'd say is that, you know, we've, we've tried to be aggressive with young players. You know, when we had Mitchell here who unfortunately got hurt, but Joey Weimer, Sal Freelich, uh, Bryce Terang, you know, we've, we've pushed a lot of guys here that are young uh, to the big leagues, you know, very soon. And we think it is a good challenge for them. You know, at the same time, We've also had to option really good players going back to guys like Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff, Freddie Peralta, you know, and had that same conversation with Bryce Terang this year when he, when we optioned him. It's like, look, you know, you 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 came here and and look, there's more to work on, you know, and, and that you're not the first great player to be optioned, you know, and, and we've optioned other great players. And it is a the, the good ones, you know, respond. And, and honestly, the, that's that's the thing that, you know, they're probably going to be upset. And anybody that ha- happened to be optioned, you probably don't want them around. Um, you know, and, and it's really a credit to those guys to bounce back, learn from it, grow, and then come out better on the other side. Have you ever asked Mark A for more money? Mark Antanasio, the owner, have you been like, I know this is our budget. Can I get just a little bit more? And I know you're kind of new at the whole, the whole position, but just a little bit more? All the time. All the time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, but but look, he's any he, any he responds. I think, and he helped us. I mean, I think we we don't get the guys we got at the trade deadline without his support. Um, we don't go above and beyond, uh, you know, on on the draft without his support. You know, and and I think to have some sustainability, you have to have great ownership, and we certainly have that here in Milwaukee. Matt, I want to ask you about the catching machine that you have, and if Eric Kratz had anything to do with the fact that no, they they shit can Eric Kratz as soon as they could. So apparently he wasn't involved, and he didn't get all the secrets. That was a long time ago, though. But 
you, you bring a guy over and it, it Matt, to me, it's getting, it's getting like ridiculous because you guys have such an edge in that department. And we've spoken to other brewers about this where it doesn't even take long. It, the transformation happens so quickly, say with someone like William Contreras, who comes up last year, rookie, he's really young, he's learning the position. I'm sure you could see some of those signs of improvement back then but immediately comes to your squad and he's like one of the best framers and receivers in the game. How does that happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's probably a combination of, of the player themselves and, and then our coaches as well. I mean, I think, you know, Kratzy was probably the OG uh, receiver back there. You know, he's one of the best there was way back, even before there were the, the early metrics, you know, this guy showed up at the top of the charts and I'm not just saying that, I mean, you really did. And, and, you know, it starts with with recognizing, I think, the value of, of what catchers bring on a day to day basis. Um, and it's not just it's not just what they do as far as receiving catch and throw. It's also how you call a game, you know, and, and learning that side of the game. And it's it's really complicated. Um, and it's something that, it, again, it's just hard to measure that that type of person. And, um, you know, going back to Kratzy and, and everybody else here, those guys have just had those ingredients. And if they haven't, you know, we've tried to just instill those through coaching and uh, and good training to the extent that we can provide that uh, those avenues for those guys to improve. You made me blush. All right, so we're gonna. He's making you money, Kratzy. Yeah, he made me money because he brought me up time. to the big leagues. Yeah, exactly. Just, just to catch the ball. So I appreciate that. I know it was all Matt. So that's where we're gonna leave it. It's not even a compliment. We all, we all. This is such a random question. I wrote it down, but we have a GM on here now, and we always say this. Are GMs afraid of trading within the division? Absolutely not. I, I think maybe some Thank are, you. but I think at least for me, I think I think it's a good opportunity. Like if if it if we're in the right situation, I think you know it, it, if it helps both sides, then great. You know, and we have good relationships within the division, and so we'd have no issues trading in the division at all. So why didn't you trade for Nolan Arenado? <laughs> Corbin Burns told him not to. Oh, Corbin Burns I'm said like, no. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great player. <laughs> He's a great player. All right. So let's finish with this on the personal side because we do like to do this too, of course, right? Lo- loose combos. For you, Matt, and I know I know what the position's like, not personally, but hearing from guys, right? It's a 25-hour-a-day job. Um, what do you do if, if you need to unwind, kick back, you know, you're watching, you know, another sport for a few hours. Do you have a certain hobby that you like to go to in, say, the off season? if you don't have to be at the office all night? What's your what's one thing that we might not know about you that you really enjoy? Man, I don't I don't have a ton of hobbies. I'm pretty boring, honestly. Like I, I just I like baseball and I like I like trying to find different ways to to get better. And so I'm usually reading about it or, or doing something, you know, to, to help you know, think about what the future of the team looks like or something. So, uh, you know, when I'm, I'm not around, honestly, if, if I'm not completely plugged in, I'm usually spending time with my kids. Um, you know, if I can, that's, that's the, the biggest thing in my life right now is just making sure that, that I'm around for them as much as I possibly can. So it's December 10th. You can't sleep. It's like 11 o'clock. Um, will you watch a certain show? Will you read a certain book? Like, have you read this book and did it teach you? you anything or did it, Make you lose all interest I'll, in baseball. I'll read it. The Tao of the Backup Catcher, Playing Baseball for the Love of the Game by Tim Brown with Eric Kratz. I've I've heard about this. So I'm more of a, a podcast guy, so I can listen nice. to things and still be moving around. And so that that is on my list. I would love to get a, a copy of that. I don't know if you know anybody who could do that. but Yeah, we could. And also <laughs> there is you the audio. Pay for it, trust me. <laughs> the audio will version. make you pay for it. <laughs> yeah, make you, you pay for it because the Brewers fired me. <laughs> I could have stayed in the big leagues. All right. <laughs> but it's send part me, of the book. Send me your Venmo. Send me your Venmo, buddy. <laughs> I love it. Well, Matt, it was really a pleasure, a pleasure talking to you. Really good to get a little more info on the squad and yourself. And uh, thanks for making some history with us on FT Live. We'll bother the rest of your colleagues um, around the league coming up in the offseason especially. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Awesome to have you, uh, Matt Arnold yeah, of great. the Milwaukee Brewers. Yeah, and get the personal side too. And also, it's okay because guess what? I guarantee you at least half the answers you'll get from GMs, president of baseball ops, whatever, in the offseason. I'll be like, hey, what do you do? And they'll be like, baseball. I'll be like, what else? Kids. 
you know, hang with the kids. I'm like, what else? Nothing. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Rats, does it disappoint nothing. you that he has not read your book yet? He said he reads books all the time. No he audio though. He needs to oh, listen. Need, is you there an audio version? Yes, there is. There's an audio version. It's like nine. It's like nine hours long. As Derek oh. told me, it was three Oppenheimers long. Oh geez, so <laughs> it's long. You got You got to put it in, and you got. You don't do yard work, but it'd be a good thing to put in. I, I'm glad he came on. I wish. GMs and president, head of president, baseball operations could be more like they could be more open, but there's a lot of rules they have to follow. He is, he really is one of those guys that he embodies what he talks about, what they build the organization on is how to communicate with players. And that's like, that's the, that's the last percentage. Like there's a big difference between, or there's a small difference between talent level at the big leagues how you get the most out of your organization, how you get the most out of your teams. It's him. It's Council. It's Murph. It's Hooky. It's Walker McKinvin. Like, it's all the coaches and the guys that he's hired beneath him. And when one of them – I remember I met one of the coaches that was in the minor leagues. I won't say his name. He just wasn't very good at communicating with all the players. <laughs> and I was like, this is unbelievable because he just stood out as somebody who didn't communicate well. He gone. And it, it, you know, in those organizations, it starts at the top of how you, how you treat people. Well, in the interest of time, we've got five minutes. We'll go a little extra innings action here. Let's run through the gritty right now. Wow. That is, that is tremendous. That is incredible. Can we post that too? I did not know that we have an open. Did I miss that or did you guys just surprise me? That was I awesome. Know, I had no idea. Beautifully that. done. Beautifully done. Let's do the gritty. It's immaculate grid time. That is great. That was really good. Did you see NJ and PA strong? Yeah. All that. <laughs> that was really good. All right, let's get after it. So top, you've got the Phillies. You've got 40 plus homer seasons at the plate. You've got Hall of Famers, a left side, A's, Red Sox, and Cincinnati. We ready to play? Timer starts now. All right, we're off to a great start, dude. I don't. These are like teams that I don't know anything about. This is tough. Do you Phillies want to start with Hall of Famers? I mean, right. Famers. I played. I played for Boston, but I never got in a game, so it wouldn't be on the immaculate grid. Oh, oh no! Yeah, okay. that stinks. You got to play a game. Got to play. You got to play. Oh, you actually have to. Play. We're wasting time. We are. I mean. 40 plus homers, we should be able to get that one pretty easily. Right? Lance, Lance Nix for the Reds and the Phillies. Lance Nix, N I X. And also, isn't it Lance with like a L A Y S? Yes, with a Y. I played with his brother, Jason, Jason. Nix. Little ball of hate. Yeah, yeah. we do. Point one? Point one. That's, that's pretty good. That's a good start. So uh, A's Brand Hall of Fame. Yeah. Brandon Moss, Brandon Moss, Phillies and Red Sox. Or okay. Phillies and Phillies A's. A's. He played for both. Which but... one? Which one's more random? I'm going to say Phillies and Red Sox because he made yeah. an all-star team with the A's. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. And then A.J. Early's playing with us today. He said A's Hall of Fame go Nelly Fox. Oh. Wow. You got to go a little more you would obscure. Think. Like, don't Ricky Henderson. He will, obviously. Yeah, that was a good one. That is what a good. jaw that man has in, too, oh, by man. the way. Gosh. Yeah. Jeez. Red Sox. I mean, dude, that dude needs some teaser. Is that teaser? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, did we go Todd Frazier. Did he hit forty for the Reds? I don't think so. Oh, well, we oh can't count he did. He did, did he? for the White Sox. I don't know about the Reds. He, well, he did for the White Sox, for but it doesn't Sox, matter. I know he did. I know he's a forty home run guy, but it does doesn't mean he had to hit it for that team. I think so. Yeah. I don't know. This is bull. This is bull. Hey. Um. For Phillies, Joe Blanton. Yeah, that was the one that kept coming to mind. Is that too common for Blanton and A's? Is there, there's got to be another I one. I like right? that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of some rando, rando ones like Michael Taylor. I just don't know if he got called up with the Phillies, so I don't don't. Take what about – what about – did Rincardo Rincon, did he pitch for the Phillies? I thought he did. No, maybe not. I Lefty guy. Know. He was Indians. No, but we got two and a half minutes. I Jeremy Jambi. Yeah, Jeremy Giambi, he did. Do him. 40. Jeremy Giambi. That's a big number. Wow. It's way bigger than I Was thought it, it would be. Yeah. Wow. 20%? 20%? 
Wow. We should have gone Matt Stairs. No, nah, he's, he's too popular. All right, so we got two minutes. 40 home run seasons. Red Sox, I mean, there's a whole slew of guys. Other AJ said George Foster. I was going to say, yeah. For the Reds, though, no? Yeah. Oh, for Red Sox, Jimmy Fox was brought up. I mean, Jim Rice, you got a million dudes you can name. Manny, Ortiz. They're all so popular, though. I know. Yeah. I'd say Fox, maybe. Okay. You love Wanna the Foxes? Fox? Yeah, sure, Fox. Yeah. Foxy. Two X's, right? Yeah, you know me. I love the Foxes. Foxy lady. Two percent, all right. Two percent. George nice. Foster? Probably, yeah, because at least you're going back a little bit. Done? Yeah, Foster, you go back. He had like yeah. 50 that one year. Donkey. Oh, I love George Foster. I didn't get to watch him in person, but. All right, A's 40. We got a minute now. A little higher than I thought it would be. Jackson said Tony Perez, Reds Hall of Fame. Yeah. He's in Good there. with that because oh, we got to yeah. get three in the next minute. So we got to move. Think about what else you got. All right. Not terrible. 40 Red Sox homers. Oh, we got to go. I mean, we need like someone back like in the way back. Babe Ruth. Cy Young. Did he pitch for the Red Sox? I don't know. But I don't know who he pitched for them. Babe Ruth seems really common. Is it so common that so nobody, common, nobody picks him? That's kind of what I'm thinking. I do want to try that just to see. Yeah, Babe been, Ruth. Never like used 50%? Babe Ruth yet. I've never used Babe Ruth yeah. yet. Because uh, if you're smart, you're not using him. But do you? But maybe it's a do maybe it's Eric Kraft. Ten percent. That's see, not bad. That's not crazy. Oh, okay. Like forty percent. All right. So we need an A's forty homer season. Uh. Jermaine die? No, he never hit forty. Not for them. Hmm. I mean, Jeremy, Jason Giambi. We could go Giambi and Giambi next to each other. Yeah, that one's gonna be high. But Reggie, we're running out of time. Reggie did. Jose did. McGuire. McGuire did. McGuire. We got ten seconds. Sure. So, I think Reggie. I'm thinking Reggie. Reggie. Okay. Yeah. I feel like Reggie's gonna be high. 62, all right. 9%? 9%? Not terrible. All right. right. Not 62 bad. 62 on the flies, not bad. Brandon and we made Walsh. it just in time, too. Dude, the Jeremy Giambi one killed us. I wonder, what, I wonder what the Matt Stairs would have been. Or the Brandon mm. Moss there. Mm. Mm. Easy to look back, but the pitch clock already expired. Yeah. Let's slap pitch it. Pitch clock sucks. <laughs> Don't say that in the playoffs. Jason Nix, a little ball of hate. <laughs> all right that was fun we're going to try and do a more immaculate grid action so that when you're bored in the winter time and it's freezing cold maybe wherever you are not here then you can just watch all of our gritties so we the only thing i want to definitely get to is the conversation with buster Olney and just a remarkable fan interview that we had where the dude reached over for the baseball in Houston and then gave him a lot of credit. We can just give you a little sound bite from that. It would be wonderful because that dude is called good for the game. Can we run that? So tell us about that play and how it developed. So pretty much I'm out here with my son. This is our first ever game. And I just wanted to make the moment special for him. As a father, I feel like it's my job to make sure that I give him the best moments. I apologize to the Astro organization. I didn't know. Y'all got to understand, when it's dropping down, it looked like it's coming directly to you. And my body went for what I know. But we did have a wonderful moment. What was the reaction that you heard right after the play was over? The reaction was shock, disgust, happiness, <laughs> sweat, a little bit of lust, baby. Charlie Ray, we're going to be on TV, baby. <laughs> Looked like that you went away for a bit and then you came back. How'd you talk your way back? Houston loves me and I love Houston, <laughs> and they yeah. cannot stop me from supporting the Astros. I almost had to give a bop, 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 bop real quick on them. So salute to the whole organization. Great staff. They made sure that I was healthy and I was enjoying the game. They wasn't even making it serious. I mean, where do we start? He has a, he has a Royals hat on. <laughs> he does. <laughs> a Royals hat, randomly. Yeah, and the then he said, good. all love for the Asteroids. I mean, he's like, I think he's playing the video game Asteroids. He's like, pop, pop, pop. Yeah. Did he say it real or did he say it jokingly? No, he. Well, I think he. I don't think that was a joke. I don't know. I just know that that. We're gonna be on TV, baby. 
<laughs> he was a master with words. He was. I mean, he had his arm around Buster like we're like they were like go way back. Yeah, right? he was great. He was having a great time. He's like, yo, we're gonna be able to have this moment together forever with his son. He reached over, by the way, if you're listening to the pod, like a, a person and a half great to time. grab a, a foul Sweet. ball and and not get it, but interfere a little bit. My thing, Kratzy, that I actually just caught. I've watched it three times in the past. Did you see towards the end? There was a woman who was going through the row who was like trying to move his son over to like get through with her beer. I'm like, um, ma'am, ESPN national interview. Can you give us a minute? I couldn't believe that she just barged right through that interview, not giving a fuck. <laughs> she wasn't the only one during that interview. I was watching the game. Her husband or somebody else, they they came through too. They were in the way. But it was my favorite part was when he when you see him like stand up like hey, what wasn't me? Wasn't me? Another foul ball went into the stands towards him, and it kind of like banged around. And he just was like, "Well, not me, not me." Like he had, he <laughs> had. Again. We shouldn't, we shouldn't condone reaching over, but this was hilarious. Yeah, it was. It you was can great. reach over if you give this interview. <sighs> yeah, fair. If you have random MLB hat on that's not playing in the stadium, and you call the home team by the wrong name. You can reach over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> now you're a fan for life. You might not have been because you have a Royals hat at an Asteroids game, but now you're a fan. Kratz hats? Another one. Not playing in the game, but it's another Iron Pigs. See the little tail? Oop. See the little tail right here? Yeah. Iron Pigs. Mm. Lehigh Valley. Thank you very much. Ronnie Belliard. I love the tail on I the logo. I that is Ronnie Belliard in, in high school. Kind Did you? Old. Well, actually, split grip when you hit. We'll, we'll finish for you with DJ Stewart. You missed the combo. Yeah, fuck him. DJ Stewart's beloved in Queens. <laughs> I and saw. He I us, heard this. I heard all. all right, about let's this. run it. Let's run it. Uh, yeah, the, he's all the biggest Florida supporter now. ever. He knows everybody in the state, and I know what he would say. He'd go, well, DJ. I'm, I'm looking at at your uh, your bio here and you're from Gainesville but you went to FSU and he's a big big UF guy and you play with Pete Alonzo so can you give me the backstory on how all that went down yeah he probably isn't talking too much after that game last night uh, but mm, yeah. hell yeah tell him <laughs> clip this yep. clip this yep. he got, do you know but, what he uh, said DJ he goes what, this is what he said right right at, at the end of, of the show or at the end of when we were talking about what's going to happen that game he goes what the fuck is a you? What the fuck is a you? <laughs> we'll run it back for him on Tuesday because he found yeah. out. He, he definitely found out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, this is all I'm going to say to DJ. You better check his career record against Florida when he played at Florida State. It wasn't real good. You have took him? So what the fuck is a seminar? It wasn't his fault. He had some numbers, dude. He was a stud in matter. college. They look, at their, look at his stat. Look at their record. Hey, you should take your beef up with Scotty. Did you like his impersonation? Yeah, that was Woo. brutal. What the fuck is a you? Do you do, no, hey, do, do I'm this? At, Dude, I, by the way, from. a couple people on like either Instagram or Twitter were like, a you is a gator killer. <laughs> I'm like, Dude, oh, good one. Well, I don't want to calm down. Bad jokes all it's day. college football talk. <laughs> Come on. Wednesday on FT Live, Ken Rosenthal swings back and Jared Carabas will join us for the first time. We will do an obit. Although now we might be a little premature. We were like, let's do an obit for the Red Sox season. They're like yeah. creeping and crawling back. We'll There's get that. his take on it. On Wednesday on FT. We'll Happy see you birthday, then. Ava. Hope you have a great day at Happy school. Happy birthday, Ava. Just because you're 18 doesn't mean you don't have to go to school. <laughs> Did she go? Yeah, hell yeah, she went. <laughs> <laughs>